I never saw it coming. Fifteen years of marriage, gone in the blink of an eye. She left me for a rich doctor, thinking she had traded up. But she didn't just leave. She took my daughter with her, betraying me twice over. I was supposed to roll over, let them walk away without a fight. But they underestimated me. My revenge was swift, calculated, and brutal. I made sure their perfect little world crumbled, just like they shattered mine. Now, they live in the ruins of their own making, while I rise from the ashes. This is my story. I shrugged again. You're right, Kim. She looked at me with a worried expression. Terry, tomorrow it's very likely that Carol will be in the courtroom. As your lawyer, can I suggest you stay as far away from her as you can? Your talks can get a bit heated. We both laughed. Not a problem, Kim. If I don't need to speak to her, I won't. Great. She stood up and headed towards the door, but turned around before she left. And Terry! I glanced at her. She playfully put her hands on her chest. Thanks for looking out for me all those years. These days, my attention is all on Paul and Candace. But with those nice girls your fiancé has, it's amusing to still feel noticed by my little brother. She beamed. I felt my cheeks warm up, but I chuckled. Hey, that's what little brothers do. I quickly became serious. But really, I couldn't ask for a better sister than you, Kim. I really care about you. I know, Terry. I care about you, too. The next day at the right time, Dad, Kim, Melody, Harmony, and I sat in the courtroom gallery with a bunch of people I didn't know. We were all waiting for the hearing of Dr. Morrison. Technically, he was still a doctor at this point, but we all thought it wouldn't be long before the medical board took his title away. Today would tell us more. A few moments before the hearing began, a lawyer entered and took their place for the defendant. With them came Carol, who was dressed simply and looked unwell. She didn't glance at us, and we mostly ignored her as she sat right behind the defense. Dr. Morrison was brought in through a side door by security and sat next to his lawyers. I don't think he noticed me. He just stared at the floor. We all stood when the judge entered and sat down after calling the hearing to order. This is an arraignment hearing for Dr. Stephen Morrison on charges of, he paused to check his notes, assault with intent to cause harm and attempted murder against Mr. Terry Other. I also see here that you have previously verbally confronted Mr. Other twice before today. Is that correct, Dr. Morrison? One of his lawyers spoke up. Your Honor, on behalf of my client, I'd like to point out that neither of the past incidents is related to the current charges against Dr. Morrison. The judge raised an eyebrow. Counsel, I see your last name is also Morrison. What is your relationship to the defendant? I'm his cousin, Your Honor, the lawyer replied. Well, Mr. Morrison, even though you are family, I think you should review the evidence against your cousin before entering my courtroom. From what I read in my file leading up to this case, I viewed a concerning video where your cousin, Dr. Stephen Morrison, verbally attacked and then threatened Mr. Other's life. Have you not seen this video related to your client? He tried to change the topic. Your Honor, we asked after the incident that the video not be used in this case and paid the necessary fees to both the courts and the medical board. The video was not meant to be part of any evidence. I request that it be removed from this case or any future hearings. I glanced at Kim, who looked pleased with herself. At first, my dad had mentioned that I had taken the video when Carol, Mackenzie, and Stephen confronted me outside the cafe. Their legal team acted quickly. They seemed to have rushed to get a court order to keep the video from being used, and that's what the lawyer, who was also related to him, was talking about now. I made eye contact with Kim, and she signaled for me to pay attention. If they believed money could cover up what happened that day, they were very wrong. The judge looked amused, Mr. Morrison. First, any order you think you had to hide your client's actions was not done legally and would never be allowed after review. Second, whatever money your client paid does not stop legal action when someone's life was at risk. The defense side of the room seemed to shrink. Third, on a personal note, I have watched the video and I am not impressed with your client or his family. The judge went on, the video your client tried to hide supports what we are discussing today. That is, your client, Dr. Stephen Morrison, assaulted and tried to harm Mr. Terry Other. Does your client understand the charges? He asked both men. 
The man and his cousin both looked nervous, and his cousin answered, He does, Your Honor. Good, the judge then looked at everyone else in the gallery. Is Mr. Terry Other here today? I stood up and responded, Yes, Your Honor, I am. Both Carol and the man turned to look at me for the first time. Carol looked surprised while the man looked angry. Mr. Other, the judge asked, would you be willing to answer a few questions? My lawyer is here with me, Your Honor. I would be happy to answer questions. However, would it be okay if she came forward with me? I asked. The judge smiled. Of course, please come forward. Kim and I walked to the front of the courtroom and sat down in what would usually be where the prosecution sits. Kim leaned in close and told me that I should be honest and look at her if I needed help. Now, Mr. Other, this is just a simple hearing, and I'm hoping you can help me with a few details, he said, shuffling through some papers. He was looking at various reports about my connection with the Morrisons. Mr. Other, can you explain your relationship with the defendant? The judge asked. Um, sure. Dr. Morrison is married to my ex-wife, and he has adopted my daughter Mackenzie as his own. Other than three brief meetings, I have no relationship with him or my former family, nor do I want one, I said, feeling a bit shaky. This was hard. The last time I was in court was for my divorce, and I hadn't said a word then. That makes sense, Mr. Other. Do you still have contact with your ex-wife or your daughter? The judge asked. No, Your Honor. Since the divorce, I've only seen Carol a few times, and those meetings were not good for either of us. I've only seen Mackenzie a couple of times, I replied. So you would say you have no relationship with your ex-wife or daughter? He asked again. Correct, Your Honor, I said, shaking my head. On the day everything changed, I got the divorce papers, the adoption request for Mackenzie, and a restraining order to keep me away from them until all the legal matters were settled. I took a deep breath. The judge looked encouraging, so I went on. I took it very hard, Your Honor. It felt like neither Carol nor Mackenzie wanted me in their lives anymore. I was really down, and with those three documents, it felt like they were saying I wasn't good enough as a father, husband, or provider. In fact, Carol wrote in her letter that I was not a good plumber. So no, Your Honor, I have no relationship with my ex-wife or daughter. I understand, the judge said, looking at me carefully. Can you explain why you recorded the video from the incident at Maitland Cafe? He asked. I straightened up. Yes, I came back to visit my family because my mother has been diagnosed with a rare bone cancer. I heard a gasp. It was Carol. She hadn't known. I continued. I went to see my mother after her first treatment. I wanted to grab some coffee and breakfast for my parents, so I went to Maitland Central, which has the best coffee. I smiled, and a few people nodded in agreement. Most knew about Wolf Coffee, which is popular here in Australia. Anyway, I was just texting someone when my former daughter confronted me. I tried to walk away and avoid making a scene, but Dr. Morrison wanted to pursue the issue. Back in the cafe, I felt that a problem was about to happen, so I decided to record what was going on just in case I needed to protect myself later. Did you tell the person involved or your family that you were filming them? The judge asked. No, Your Honor, I was hoping for no trouble, and my lawyer told me later that we were in a public place. There was no law against me filming, I explained to the judge. The judge nodded. Now, Mr. Other, can you share how you felt after Dr. Morrison made a threat in the video? To be honest, Your Honor, I wasn't worried. Dr. Morrison had a relationship with my then-wife for almost two years. Then he, my ex-wife, and my daughter seemed to want to hurt me as much as possible. So, as you can imagine, Your Honor, I had some anger inside me. I'm also in good shape. I work out at least twice a week, and I knew I could handle myself if it came to that. So, no, Your Honor, I wasn't scared of any threats. Mr. Other, are you saying you thought you might have a fight with Dr. Say? Morrison? I chuckled. No, Your Honor, the good doctor. I glanced at him, and he was giving me a fierce look. Was the one who started all the trouble. I never planned to go after him, but if something happened, I wouldn't just walk away. Okay, Mr. Other, can you tell me what you were doing at the hospital that day? Sure. I came to town quickly after my mother went to the hospital with chest pains because of her cancer. While I was there, my sister, who is also here with me, had my niece. So I was moving between the cancer and maternity wards for a few days. On the day in question, Harmony, one of my girlfriends, my mother and I, were walking to the maternity ward to help my sister, when Dr. Morrison attacked me. 
One of your girlfriends, Mr. Other? The judge said, raising his eyebrows. I felt myself blush, and most of the room, except for Carol, Dr. Morrison, and his cousin, laughed at my expense. Okay, putting aside your dating life, were you not worried being in the hospital where Dr. Morrison worked? The judge asked. Again, no, I wasn't worried, Your Honor. I thought there was a chance I might run into him, but I never believed he would actually follow through with his threat. As a doctor, I thought he would stick to the, what is it called? The Hippocratic Oath, which means not to do harm. The judge looked sternly at Dr. Morrison. Yes, Mr. Other, you are right. You had no reason to worry. All right, let's continue. Just a couple more questions. How are you feeling now after what happened? Well, whatever was put in me was serious. I actually died twice in the emergency room. They said it almost happened a third time. I was out for a few days, and I'm only here now because of my family and the great doctors at Maitland Hospital. I smiled and said, Your Honor, I'm happy to say that I have fully recovered, and I have no lasting issues from my time in the hospital. I see, the judge said as he looked through some papers. Then he looked back at me with a curious expression. Just one last question, Mr. Other. Earlier, you mentioned that your ex-wife and daughter left you because you were a plumber, right? Yes, Your Honor, that's what I was told. Are you still a plumber, Mr. Other? I am still a certified master plumber, Your Honor, I answered. The judge laughed a little. That's a very formal answer, Mr. Other. Let me ask it in another way. What do you do for work now? I sensed where this was going. It seemed like the judge had some past experience that made him want to help me out. Well, today I work for Delotis Inc. as the national quality manager, handling both local and international products. Very impressive, Mr. Other. It sounds like you are much more than just a plumber. Thank you, Your Honor. That will be all. Thank you for your time, Mr. Other. With that, we went back to our seats. Carol watched me closely as I sat down with the girls, who each took one of my arms and held on tightly. We then listened to Dr. Morrison's lawyer talk nonsense. They tried to point out how great Dr. Morrison was in the community, despite my comments. At one point, the judge looked at me and raised an eyebrow when he saw how Melody and Harmony were holding on to me. I smiled back, and he tried not to laugh. After all the talk, the judge focused back on the matter at hand. Mr. Morrison, with everything that's been said today, your client should realize the seriousness of the evidence presented. How does your client plead? Your Honor, at my client's request, I am entering a plea of not guilty. Dr. Morrison's cousin looked away from everyone as he said this. A silence fell over the room. Everyone expected him to plead guilty and ask for a lighter sentence. I couldn't understand how he still thought he was innocent. I felt my anger rise and I noticed Melody and Harmony holding my hands tighter. Melody leaned in and kissed me softly on the cheek. It's okay, love. Let it go. We're here for you, she whispered. I took a deep breath and tried to relax. Noted, the judge said. I must say I'm a bit surprised, Mr. Morrison, Dr. Morrison. I will look over all the evidence, and after our talk today, I will make my suggestions for the trial. Bail for Dr. Morrison will be set at $2.5 million. He will also need to give up his passport, wear a GPS tracking device, and check in with the corrections department once a week until the case is finished. From what I have seen, I believe Dr. Morrison is not likely to run away or cause more trouble. The judge turned to Dr. Morrison. Dr. Morrison, do you understand and accept these conditions for your release? I want to hear you say it, not your lawyer. He stumbled over his words. Yeah. Yes, Your Honor. I accept and understand. Good. Now I have one last thing to say, Dr. Morrison. It is about everything from the beginning of your relationship with Mr. Other's wife to now. Are you listening? We all listened closely. Dr. Morrison swallowed hard. Yes, Your Honor, I'm listening. The judge leaned forward and looked at Stephen Morrison like he was something unpleasant on his lawn. From what I have seen and heard today, I would usually put a restraining order against you. This would stop you from coming within 100 meters of Mr. Other and his family, but I won't do that. Do you know why? No, Your Honor, he answered, sounding nervous. The judge smiled, but it was not a nice smile. I won't do it because Mr. Other has shown he can handle you even under stress. He has made it clear that he wants nothing to do with you. 
so if you see him, I suggest you turn around and walk away, or you might find yourself back in trouble. Dr. Morrison gulped and nodded. He glanced slightly at me. I caught his eye and winked, but said nothing. The judge relaxed a bit. I want to remind you, Dr. Morrison, that you have 90 days to change your plea. If I were you, I would think hard about your choices. After those 90 days, a court date will be set based on your plea at that time. This session is now closed. We all stood as the judge left. Dr. Morrison was taken out through a small door with his two lawyers, including his cousin. Carol looked back at us for a moment. Later, we sat in a coffee shop outside the court in the winter sun. It was early afternoon, and a light breeze had a chill to it as we enjoyed a late lunch. Harmony turned to Kim. So how did we do? Pretty much as expected for your guy, Kim said as she looked at me. He did really well. He's good at that, Harmony explained, as if everyone knew. Hey, I was really close to losing it when that jerk said he wasn't guilty, I complained. I know, honey, Melody said, but you had us all worried. I leaned over and kissed her, then leaned the other way and kissed Harmony. Thank you, my lovely ladies. I have to say it felt nice to give Carol a piece of my mind. A new life, a new job, and I enjoyed the surprised looks in the room when I mentioned my girlfriends. You mean fiancés? Harmony corrected. Yes, fiancés. Sorry, girls, I'm still getting used to that. But soon, they'll be my wives. Melody giggled, and Harmony looked at me, thinking, I know about our love. She paused. So I guess Carol was the woman at the front who looked like she was losing her mind while you spoke. Yeah, that's her, Kim answered for me. Harmony snorted. I didn't get a good look at her, but she really missed out. We all laughed, and then my phone buzzed. I looked and saw it was a message from Carol. Terry, I know you don't want to talk, but I would like to meet you about some things. Can you come to the courthouse steps in 15 minutes? I frowned, and Melody noticed. What's wrong, babe? I showed her the message, then Harmony, and then Kim. Doesn't she get that I don't want to see her? I thought I made that clear in front of everyone today. I know, honey, Harmony said softly. She thought for a moment, then looked at Melody and Kim. They both nodded. But I think you should go and talk to her. Just stay calm and think of us if you need to. And remember, you can always walk away, Melody added. I couldn't argue with my girls when they knew I needed to sort things out, so I sighed and accepted what they said. I met Carol a bit later on the courthouse steps. Hi, Terry, you look good, she started awkwardly. Carol, I nodded at her. Come on, Terry, is that all you have to say after 15 years? I know I hurt you, but it's been two years. Your anger can't be that strong anymore. I stared at her for a moment. Every action and every conversation from the last few years seemed planned. But for the most part, it felt like it was all about money. I clenched my jaw and gave her a skeptical look. Carol, how I feel about you doesn't matter. I know you didn't ask me here to find out how I'm doing. Since you left, you haven't even tried to ask me once. I never thought this conversation was about my feelings. So what do you really want? She looked taken aback, surprised by my calmness. Then she raised her hand to her chest, trying to look sad. Terry, have I been that cold? She attempted a sorrowful expression, but I didn't believe her. She quickly changed the subject. So it sounds like you are dating again. Was it one of the girls I saw you with? Carol asked. She must not have noticed everyone else heard the word girls. I felt my face harden. I didn't want to talk about this with Carol. Yes. She nodded, lost in thought for a moment. That's good, and now you're a quality manager, not a plumber. That's a nice upgrade, right? She said more to herself than to me. Her hands began to fidget as she looked my way. I sighed. Carol, as I've said before, I'm not interested in sharing anything about my life. I had a chance to be happy and with very few exceptions. I paused and gestured at the courthouse. I wanted her to see that our past interactions were a dark cloud over my life. Now tell me, why did you want to see me? She sighed. Terry, because of you, we have no money coming in. Sure, Stephen's trust covers the basics, but with his bail and parole, it takes away more than half of the money. We have to get special permission just to manage that. She looked up at me. I was hoping you would reconsider giving me Mackenzie's university fund so we could make sure we have enough for everything. I stared at her in shock for a moment, maybe longer, until she spoke again. This woman truly seemed out of touch. She didn't understand the hurt she caused or when to stop. Terry, did you hear me? 
With everything going on, I wondered if you would think about letting me have Mackenzie's university fund. I started to smile, and for a second, Carol did too. But then her smile faded as mine turned into a big grin, and soon I was laughing. I laughed so hard that tears filled my eyes. Carol looked embarrassed, so I stopped laughing and moved her over to a wall by the courthouse. So, Carol, let me get this straight. Your awful husband takes you from me, saying he will give you a better life. He convinces you to betray me and adopts my daughter, spinning the same lies to her. And just like that, you both leave me without any warning. I continued. He threatens me. And with your support, he tries to kill me. And now, here we are. I pointed at the courthouse where we stood and started counting on my fingers. Because of everything that has happened, he is going to lose his job, and he won't be able to work in medicine again. He might also spend the next 20 years in jail because of his actions. And now you want me, the person you wronged, the person you left behind for money, to give you money that you don't deserve. You think it's my fault and that I owe you, right? She straightened her shoulders and looked at me with a bit of pride. Well, I wouldn't say it that way, but you get the idea. If not for me, then do it for your daughter. Mackenzie and I have a certain way of living to keep up, and since Stephen can't work because of you, yes, that's what I want. I stared at her, shocked. Carol, if you were anyone else, I would say you've lost your mind. But I'm not, Terry. You know that. She smiled, thinking I might finally agree with her. I know you, Carol. And from our talks in the last two years, I can say you're completely out of touch. Her smile faded, and she stepped back as I continued. Your idea of living well doesn't matter to me. When we were married, we had a happy life and met our needs every month. I waved my hands as I spoke. You just told me how much money your husband has in his trust. Even after bail, that should be more than enough to help you until you find a job. She flinched. Yes, a job, Carol. Do you remember what it's like to have to work? However, it seems you and your daughter don't want to work like the rest of us. But again, what you want isn't yours. You didn't earn it, and you don't deserve it. I was getting upset and tried to breathe deeply. Now your sorry excuse for a husband tries to hurt me in a hospital, and you have the nerve. I took a tight breath and glared at her, throwing her words back at her. No, you have the nerve to ask me for money so you can buy more expensive clothes or other useless things. Old anger bubbled up inside me, but then I remembered the transcript that Kim showed me. I took a moment and shifted my approach while Carol looked a bit worried. I smiled. Carol, do you know why your husband dislikes me so much? As I spoke, she looked down like she did the last time I confronted her. But this time, she looked up at me. Her voice was soft and filled with curiosity. No, not really. Stephen never explained why, but he got upset whenever Mackenzie or I mentioned you, especially in the mornings. I chuckled. Carol, do you know that you talk and move in your sleep? Her curious look deepened as she tilted her head to the side. Of course, Terry. You've known that since high school. But what does that have to do with anything? Carol, I said again, you talk and move in your sleep. When we were married, you often shared your dreams with me. Your not-so-great husband got to hear them at night. So? She snapped, a little embarrassed. That doesn't explain why he... She stopped mid-sentence. That doesn't mean anything. She looked at me with a sincere, puzzled expression I hadn't seen on her face in a long time. I mean, Stephen couldn't have heard that, could he? I wasn't sure if she thought I knew something or had figured things out. It didn't matter. It was time for her to feel some hurt. Yes, Carol. Your awful husband hates me and tried to hurt me because when you sleep, you dream of being with me again. You dream about me taking you back. You think of it so much that you sometimes touch yourself while you sleep. In your dreams, you say what a mistake you made and how small Stephen is. You do this so often that one day, when you were dreaming again and he heard you, he lost it. He saw me in the hospital and couldn't handle it anymore. So the poor fool went after me. I snapped my fingers in front of her face. Watching her realize what she had done was like watching a new day dawn. Her horror was almost comforting. I lowered my voice and spoke softly. Carol, Stephen may have treated me like a fool for almost two years while you were with him, but from the day you left me, you've been so unfulfilled that you keep dreaming of us being together, like we used to be, leaving you breathless and satisfied. You remember how it felt? How I used to make you feel good? 
You're so lost now that you miss my touch and the kisses we shared in the morning. The look on her face was a mix of pain, surprise, and something else. I leaned in closer and spoke gently. But for Stephen, he knows you dream of someone who can make you happy in a way he can't. He's chasing a dream he will never reach. I stepped back and finally felt at peace for the first time in a while. Carol was breathing a little faster. Something in her eyes showed how she felt. Terry. Carol didn't know what to say. I took another step back. No, Carol, it's too late. You left me for a dream, and now those dreams are showing you just how sad your choice was. Go back to your lifeless marriage and think about everything you threw away. Goodbye, Carol. Before she could say anything more, I turned and walked away. I didn't feel like looking back at the past. I felt happy. A smile was on my face. I wasn't thinking about her at all. My good mood stayed with me for a long time. My friendships with the girls grew stronger, and we made great progress with our wedding plans. Work was going well, too, and I felt I was getting better at my job at Delo T's Inc. Then my birthday arrived, and the girls took me out for a nice dinner. After that, we went to a local club to dance. It was clear that the three of us were the center of attention in the club. The girls wore matching green dresses, looking like they stepped out of a magazine. They helped dress me in a smart navy blue suit and styled my hair, making me feel like a million bucks. During the night, a few guys came up to me asking for drugs when the girls went to the bathroom. When the second guy asked, I turned him down and wondered why he thought I would sell drugs. His answer made me laugh. Man, you've got two stunning women with you tonight. They're only looking at you. We'd do anything for just a glance from them. He looked at me closely. And you're dressed well, so we just assumed. After hearing that, my confidence soared for the rest of the night. We danced until early morning. When we got home, the girls took good care of me before we all fell asleep in a cozy, tangled mess. I didn't hear from Carol or Mackenzie on my birthday. No texts or cards, nothing at all. I didn't expect anything, just like in past years. I felt a tiny bit of hope after my last talk with my former daughter but I guess that hope was gone. When Mackenzie's birthday came a few days later, I thought I would try reaching out. I had the phone number she used to text me during her mother's separation, so I called her after lunch while at my office. It went straight to voicemail. Um, hi, Mackenzie, it's Dad. I guess it's just Terry now. I stumbled through my voicemail, unsure of what to say. This is hard for me. I know today is your birthday, and I wanted to reach out. I hope we can rebuild our relationship after our last talk. I paused for a moment. We've all gone different paths, but I miss you, my little girl. I miss our time together and spoiling you just a bit. I took a breath. Anyway, happy birthday, and I hope you have a fantastic day. Bye. I hung up and sat there for a minute, thinking. Melody walked in a moment later and sat down on my lap. She gently wiped away a tear I didn't even know was there. What's wrong, honey? She asked, looking worried. Nothing. I just called Mackenzie to wish her a happy birthday. It's today, and I thought maybe it would help us talk again, I explained to my fiancé. She stroked my cheek and said, Aw, oh, sweetie, you are such a wonderful man. Even after all they have done to you, you still want to reach out to your daughter. Just then, my phone beeped. See, that's probably Mackenzie thanking you for your message. I looked at my phone and saw it was Mackenzie, but she wasn't thanking me at all. Leave me alone. You put my father in jail. My mom is upset after talking to you, and now you want to act like you care about me? That's disgusting. Moments later, another message came through. If you really want to do something for my birthday, give me my college money so I can buy something nice for myself. Otherwise, just keep being a terrible dad. I was shocked by her words. Then came the last message that crushed what was left of my relationship with her. You know what? Don't give me anything for my birthday like you haven't for the last few years. I'm old enough to sue you for it, and I will. Get ready because I will take everything from you. I dropped my phone and slid back in my chair, Melody still sitting on my lap. What did I do, Melody? Why do I deserve such anger from my own child? At Mom and Dad's, I thought we might reconnect one day. But now this. I was stunned by how fierce and full of hate Mackenzie's messages were. For a few minutes, neither of us spoke. Then Melody turned to me. Terry, you haven't done anything wrong. 
This girl has been filled with lies and taught to think badly of you. We know Dr. Morrison is out on bail, so he's probably been saying awful things about you, and that's affected how she feels. I nodded. The warmth of Melody's hand on my arm was comforting. She picked up my phone and went to the desk. I watched as she dialed what I guessed was Mackenzie's number. After a moment, someone answered. Hello, is this Miss Mackenzie Morrison? I only heard Melody's side of the call. Hi, Miss Morrison. I just wanted to check if you sent those texts to Mr. Terry's phone a moment ago. She listened for a moment. I see. It doesn't matter who I am, Miss Morrison, but yes, I am with him right now. Again, she listened, her brow furrowing. Okay, Miss Morrison, I will let him know and thank you for confirming it was you. I don't think we will talk again, Melody said before hanging up. I'm sorry, but your former daughter is really difficult, my fiancé said to me. I had never heard her use such strong words before. It showed how upset she was. She settled back on my lap, quiet for a moment while she gathered her thoughts. I could feel her frustration and began to rub her back. When she noticed, much of her anger faded away. She admitted to sending those messages. She wants that money and said she's going to get a lawyer and sue you, Melody said with a concerned look. She told me to tell you that you ruined her life and that she'd rather you not be around anymore. I'm really sorry, Terry. If you thought she felt sorry at Maitland, that's completely gone now. I lowered my head. I know, Melody. This feels like the end between us. I had hoped we might fix things one day, but I guess that's not possible now. Melody wrapped her arms around me. I know our love, she said softly. I see how hurt you are and how much you wanted to make things right. She leaned in and kissed me, then pulled back to look into my eyes. All I can say is that Harmony and I are here for you. We don't like what she did to you, but if that hadn't happened, you wouldn't have met us. I smiled and then kissed her back. I know, Melody. I guess we will wait and see what happens next. Part of me can't help but think that my last talk with Carol or being in court with Stephen pushed things with Mackenzie. Of course, Terry, I'd bet on it. She sounded almost trained in what she said when I spoke to her. I'm angry with her for hurting you, but a small part of me feels sorry for her. In a few years, she might feel a lot of anger and regret and not know how to handle it. The real question is whether you want to be there for her when that happens. I took a moment to think about her question. I don't know, Melody. It's too painful to think about Mackenzie. I'm not sure I could be there for her if she suddenly showed up at my door. So, I guess it's time to finally close that part of my life. I looked up and smiled at her again. But on the bright side, I have two wonderful women I love very much, who I'm going to marry, and who both want to have children with me. Wow, you really know how to make a girl happy, Melody said, kissing me again. Just then, Sally, my assistant, walked into the room and asked, What's all this talk about kids? Terry is joking about making sure both Harmony and I are ready to start a family. Sally laughed. Over the past year, she had become a close friend, and she was one of my two bridesmaids for the wedding. Kim was the other bridesmaid. With the way you girls walk, I don't think it'll take Terry long to notice, I joked. Practice makes perfect, I replied. Hey, you stay out of this, Melody said. Sally and I want to discuss your amazing skills, not with you. I kept quiet, but I felt Melody press a bit closer against me as they chatted. That night we told Harmony, William, and Martha about our call with Mackenzie. Then we called Kim and shared what happened. They were all shocked and agreed to focus on the wedding, waiting to see if anything came from Mackenzie's threat. It was just a month before the wedding when Kim got the papers saying Mackenzie was suing me for the money in the university account. The court date was set for the Monday after my wedding to the girls. We were supposed to leave for our honeymoon that Monday evening, so we had to change our plans. William arranged for us to take a special flight on Sunday afternoon, and then another flight to Sydney after my court appearance on Monday morning. This way, we could catch our international flight to Honolulu later that day. The Delotese family had generously given us enough for a ten-day, all-expenses-paid honeymoon. As we planned, I felt certain that the issue with Mackenzie would be settled in court, and then I could just focus on my wonderful brides. Despite some concerns about having three of us get married in the church, the wedding went beautifully. Pastor Dan got help from several members of the church, along with Martha, to decorate the place. During the ceremony, William proudly walked both his daughters down the aisle, wearing matching dresses with a train that stretched behind them, 
showing their hope to be wives together. Most of the Deloitte's Inc. staff were there with their partners, and William had even flown my parents up for the weekend, along with Paul, my best man, Kim the bridesmaid, and Candace, who was now laughing and enjoying everything around her. When Pastor Dan smiled and said, You may kiss your brides, I got to kiss both my girls while everyone clapped. As we signed the registry, Harmony and I filled out the official wedding papers, watched by Pastor Dan, Melody, and Paul. Then, we all signed the last pages of the legal agreement Kim prepared for Melody to be officially recognized as my partner in a civil relationship. We had already signed the main document, which said that, in every way but officially, I was Melody's life partner. While we wouldn't be married in the traditional sense, we agreed to many things that a married couple would share. Kim had even printed the signature page on the same kind of paper as the official wedding list. After the wedding, we had about a hundred guests at the party. I danced with both of my brides, while William and my dad took turns dancing with whichever bride I wasn't with. I also danced with both Martha and my mum, who was getting weaker. She was facing cancer, and while she wasn't getting better, she wasn't getting worse either. Each round of treatment helped reduce the cancer, but it also made her feel worse. We heard some good news about a new treatment involving a bone marrow transfer and a new chemotherapy drug, but that would take a few years to be available. Still, we held on to that hope. Most of our guests stayed until we left around one in the morning. Mom and Dad had arranged our hotel room. It had been a long day, so we fell asleep quickly after sharing a quiet moment together. In the morning, feeling refreshed, we shared another special moment. My brides gave me a treasured gift. They both opened up to me in new ways. I had never experienced that before. I had to use a lot of care and patience, but we all found it to be meaningful. I enjoyed being close to them, and they both felt joy in that moment as well. After checking out, we went back home to friendly smiles and a light lunch with William, Martha, Mum, Dad, Kim, and Paul before heading to the private airstrip for our flight to Maitland. Mom and Dad, along with Kim, Paul, and Candace, would be traveling with us. I hadn't thought much about the court hearing about Mackenzie's claim. However, as we took off, I opened the folder that Kim had given me. The hearing was to be private, since Mackenzie was above the age of consent but still legally a minor. She could sue me as an adult, but it could only happen in family court, and only close family members could attend. This meant that only the attorney, who was no longer a doctor, Carol Mackenzie, my lawyer, and I could be there. Mackenzie was suing me for the original amount of $142,000 from the account at the time of my divorce from Carol. In addition to that, she wanted an extra $250,000, claiming emotional distress and financial trouble. Since my brides couldn't go into the courtroom, Paul and my girls waited at a cafe across the street from the courthouse while Mom and Dad headed home. Kim and I would go into court together and see what would happen. We didn't see anyone else until we were called into the courtroom. They entered through a different door, so on my side it was just Kim and me. The Morrison and Carol were wearing clothes that looked fancy, almost like they were going to court. Mackenzie, on the other hand, had on a nice suit and lots of jewelry, trying to show off a wealthy lifestyle. But honestly, it just looked a bit cheap for a girl who was now 17. It took a few more minutes for the judge to arrive. During that time, I caught several nasty looks from the Morrison. At his signal, Mackenzie made it very clear she didn't like me. She ran her thumb across her throat and mouthed the word jerk, while the Morrison smiled and seemed proud of her. I turned my attention back to the front of the court, trying not to show how I felt. Kim placed her hand on my arm and whispered that I would be okay. If I managed to get through this, I could set off for my honeymoon with my wives. That thought made me smile. Then the judge walked in, and my smile grew wider, while the Morrison and Carol looked unhappy. Today, the same judge who had granted our divorce was back. Kim squeezed my hand as we stood up to show respect. All right, this court is now in session the judge announced, and we all took our seats. He looked over some papers for a few moments, then glanced at Mackenzie before looking at me. So, it seems we've all met before. Mr. Other and Mrs. Morrison? I remember you both from a few years ago, correct? Yes, Your Honor, I replied. Carol nodded, but didn't say anything. The judge shifted his focus back to Mackenzie. And you are Miss Mackenzie Morrison? the daughter of Mr. Terry Other and adopted daughter of Dr., I mean, Mr. Stephen Morrison. Is that right? 
I had to hold back a chuckle at the mix-up. Encouraged by her lawyer, Mackenzie answered, Yes, sir. I mean, yes, Your Honor. And we're here today because you are suing your biological father for, he glanced down at his notes, university expenses and claims of emotional harm and financial trouble. Is that correct, Miss Morrison? With a nod from her lawyer, she confirmed, You are correct, sir. I mean, Your Honor. The judge paused to read a little longer. It seems that your adopted father recently tried to harm your biological father and almost succeeded. According to the report, your biological father faced serious medical issues twice in the hospital. Mackenzie turned to look at me, shock on her face. It seemed she hadn't been told by either the Morrison or her mother. I kept my eyes on the judge. So as a result, the judge continued, your adopted father has lost his medical license is waiting for trial, and is only here today because of special permission for you as a minor in this case against your biological father. The judge then looked at Mackenzie with a curious expression. Miss Morrison, can you please tell me why you are suing your biological father? Throughout this entire conversation, Mackenzie couldn't take her eyes off me. She didn't hear what the judge said. Miss Morrison? Her lawyer gently tapped her arm. She turned her attention back to the judge. From the way you have been staring at Mr. Other, I take it you did not know that your adopted dad tried to hurt your biological dad, or that Mr. Other was nearly killed. No, um, no, Your Honor, I didn't know. Mackenzie suddenly looked uncertain. So, Miss Morrison, the judge said, let's change the topic a bit. Can you tell me, based on what you know, how Mr. Terry Other, your biological father, has caused you any kind of emotional pain? Um, well, it's like, he... Mackenzie looked very unsure. She glanced at her mom, then at her adopted dad, and then back at me. Both of them frowned at me. I kept my eyes straight ahead. Her lawyer spoke up. Your Honor, if I may, Miss Morrison's claim of emotional pain is based on Mr. Other's refusal to leave her dad alone. The judge seemed amused by the lawyer's words, but listened. Mr. Other has come into contact with her dad multiple times, each time causing distress for the family. This is why we are discussing this claim of emotional pain. I see. Mr. Forsyth, is it? Yes, Your Honor. And how long have you been practicing law, Mr. Forsyth? Two years, Your Honor. I understand two years. How many cases have you worked on that involve family members suing each other based on weak and unverified proof? Um, this would be my first case, Your Honor. Yes, it does sound like your first one, Mr. Forsyth. The judge smiled slightly. Mr. Forsyth, Miss Morrison, let me bring you up to speed. First, I do not have any proof that shows Mr. Other has been cruel or unfair to his former daughter. In fact, the police reports and video evidence I have seen show the opposite. The judge looked at Mackenzie. Miss Morrison, do you often call your biological father who raised you for most of your life an asshole? Your Honor, I object, Mackenzie's lawyer said. Miss Morrison shouldn't have to answer a rude question like that. Overruled, Mr. Forsyth. I have proof here from text messages sent recently to Mr. Other and from video evidence in this case showing that Mr. Morrison tried to hurt Mr. Other. The judge said calmly, I ask again, Miss Morrison, do you call your biological father an asshole? She hesitated and turned red but tried to answer. Um, I'm embarrassed to say yes, Your Honor, but I didn't know Stephen tried to hurt him. If I had known... The judge raised his hand. I wasn't asking for an explanation, Miss Morrison. I was just asking a simple question. Now let me ask you another question. Did your biological father ever hurt you before you and your mother left him? Did he ever show a lack of love and care? Mackenzie looked at me. I stayed silent and stared at the judge, too afraid to meet her gaze. No, Your Honor, he was always kind. She kept her head down. Thank you, Miss Morrison. One more question the judge said. After the day when you and your mother left your real father for your adopted father, did Mr. Other ever mistreat you? Mackenzie glanced at me, then at Carol, and finally at the man we were talking about. He gave a slight nod, trying not to be noticed. Her voice was soft. Yes, Your Honor, many times. The judge leaned back. I felt like yelling, but Kim held my hand tightly. I understood the warning and stayed quiet. Can you explain what you mean by mistreatment, Miss Morrison? Even a minor can face trouble for lying in court. 
the judge asked. Mackenzie looked back at the man, got another nod, and then turned to me. It was the first time I met her eyes since the judge walked in. She looked scared and lost. I wished I could help her, but I felt helpless. For the first time, Kim spoke up. Objection, Your Honor. I believe Miss Morrison has been influenced in her answers. Sustained, Counselor, and I agree. Security, please escort Mr. Morrison out of this room for the rest of this hearing. Mr. Morrison, if you think I haven't noticed your signals to Miss Morrison when you thought no one was watching, you are mistaken. I am close to holding you in contempt. You can't do this, the man shouted. That person has to pay for ruining my life. I'm not telling my daughter what to say. I'm just making sure she knows how to express herself so everyone knows the truth. Quiet! The room fell silent. Mr. Morrison, you are now in contempt of court and will stay in the holding area until it is determined if you broke your parole from your own case. Security, please remove this man. For the next few moments, everyone watched as security took him away while he yelled insults and vowed revenge against me. It looked like those dreams Carol had really affected him. The judge called for order again. Now, Miss Morrison, I will ask you once more. Has Mr. Other ever treated you badly or mistreated you in any way? He asked. Please look directly at me as you answer and feel free to explain if needed. I saw Mackenzie tremble slightly. Carol looked at me and everyone waited. Finally, Mackenzie spoke, but her voice broke. No, sir, he has never treated me badly. I know he was hurt and angry when we left him. I know we caused him pain, but he tried to teach me even when he felt disappointed. He has never been cruel to me, my father. I mean, Stephen has been so upset with Dad since we moved in with him. Mom and Stephen keep telling me how much better off I am now and how Dad would have treated me badly if I stayed in touch with him after the divorce. Tears were running down her face. Kim held my hand tightly, but I tried not to let it bother me. I felt a bit sorry for her, and maybe there was a small part of me that still cared. But she did so much to push away any feelings I had for her. Since she was my daughter, it hurt even more than what her mother did. Plus, if she learned from her mother, this could all be a show. Mackenzie continued. When Stephen and Dad fought at the hospital and Dad hit Stephen, I was told Dad lied and made Stephen lose his job. I heard many times that all our money problems were Dad's fault. I didn't know. She looked at me even when the judge asked her to focus on him. I didn't know that Stephen tried to hurt him. She cried. Daddy, I'm so sorry. I didn't know. I really didn't. Hearing her words touched my heart a little. The tiny warmth inside me grew, but it didn't turn into anything more. I looked away from my daughter. I had to keep my feelings in check. The judge spoke again. Miss Morrison, please focus on me again. Mackenzie looked up at the judge. Thank you for your honest answer. This is the first time we've heard the truth from you today. Now I invite Mr. Other or his attorney to respond to the claim of mental cruelty. Kim spoke up. We appreciate Miss Morrison's honesty just now. However, we have nothing more to add, and we still deny that claim of mental cruelty. Noted. Thank you, Counselor. I believe we can safely dismiss this claim, correct? The judge looked at everyone, and both sides agreed. Now let's move to the issue of financial hardship, he said. I'm having trouble understanding this one, Miss Morrison. In your parents' divorce agreement, the money meant for your university was kept with Mr. Other because you chose to let Mr. Morrison adopt you. This was because your biological father was the only one who put money into that account. Since you and your mother decided to cut ties with him and get a restraining order, I felt the funds were no longer yours. In your mother's letter to your biological father, she said the reason for your choice was that he couldn't give you a good life as a plumber. He held up a copy of the letter. Carol turned red, seeing it again after all this time. Now, since you removed yourself from his care, I don't understand how you can blame your financial troubles on him. Would you like to explain? Mr. Forsyth, you can speak for your client since she seems upset from our last talk, the judge said. Yes, Your Honor. He glanced at the papers in front of him. The Morrisons believe their money problems come directly from their dealings with Mr. Other after the divorce. The judge nodded. I see where you're going, but your reasoning might be off. Please explain why you think Mr. Other is to blame for the Morrisons' money troubles. Well, Your Honor, if Mr. Other hadn't continued seeing Mr. Morrison, then Mr. Morrison wouldn't have been put on probation. 
he wouldn't have threatened Mr. Other or gotten into a fight with him, which led to him losing his job. Now they have to rely only on Mr. Morrison's trust fund to get by. The judge leaned back in his chair and picked up a pen, watching Mr. Forsyth closely. Mr. Forsyth, I don't think you realize how silly that sounds when I look at the evidence I have. You say Mr. Other is responsible for the Morrison's money troubles and should pay them? But from what I see, it was the Morrisons who caused the problems. Mr. Other was hurt badly, even twice, and he was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. The judge seemed to enjoy the lawyer's unease. Yes, Your Honor, we still argue that if Mr. Other hadn't been in those places, Mr. Morrison wouldn't have done what he did, and the Morrisons wouldn't be in their current situation. So, Mr. Other should provide financial help for that. I see. That seemed to be the judge's favorite phrase. He turned to Kim and me. Would you like to respond? Of course, Your Honor, Kim said. While my client acknowledges that there were interactions with Mr. Stephen Morrison, Mrs. Carol Morrison, and Miss Mackenzie Morrison, at no point does my client accept financial responsibility for what happened. Kim took a breath. We live in a free society where we can choose who we interact with. In every incident involving my client and the Morrisons, they approached him first. He never started the contact. In each case, except for the one in the hospital where he was given unknown drugs, my client tried to distance himself from the situation. It was my client who was mistreated in these interactions. Also, it's our view that the Morrisons could have chosen not to engage with my client and simply walked away. If they had done that, they wouldn't be facing these money problems today. If they had kept to themselves, we wouldn't be here. Their situation is a result of their choices. The judge looked at Kim. An interesting argument, counselor and one I can agree with under these circumstances. I glanced at Mackenzie again. She seemed to have missed all of that discussion. She was still crying in her chair. Carol was looking between Mackenzie and me, unsure of what to say. Considering everything, I decide that the money will stay with Mr. Other, the judge began. I raised my hand. May I speak, Your Honor? The judge turned to me. Yes, Mr. Other. What would you like to say? I took a deep breath like the other people had done when they spoke. This was going to be hard. Your Honor, I want to be clear. I don't have any feelings left for my ex-wife. She left me for someone else, and I can't forgive her for that. My daughter has also hurt me deeply. The way she has treated me in the last few years has really hurt. A lot of the love I used to have for her is gone. I understand, Mr. Other. I see this more often than I wish in my work. What are you trying to express? I want to do one last thing for my daughter, I said. Mackenzie looked up at me, and I could see a spark of hope in her eyes. Your Honor, I have built a new life over the last couple of years. It hasn't been easy. I have faced many struggles, mostly from the two ladies over there and the gentleman you removed earlier. I smiled slightly. Through it all, I have found love again. In fact, I got married just this past weekend, and we plan to go on our honeymoon after this meeting. I realize I may not want to see either my ex-wife or my daughter again. I want to keep moving forward with my new family and create a happy life. The judge raised an eyebrow. I reached out my hand to Kim and she pulled out the paper I needed. Her expression asked if I was sure I wanted to do this. I didn't really want to, but I wanted to be finished with this part of my life. This document is from my lawyer. It says that I will put $142,000 from the bank account I planned for Mackenzie's university into a special trust account. Carol's mouth dropped open in surprise. I couldn't see Mackenzie's face clearly. She was still crying. The money in this trust can only be used for Mackenzie's living and school expenses when she goes to university. As she is 17, she can start university next year. If she gets in, most of her costs will be covered by this money. But if she doesn't go to university, the trust money will stay untouched until she is 30. At that time, she can take out up to $5,000 each month. I also have one more condition. Neither Carol nor Mackenzie Morrison may contact me again. I heard Mackenzie take a deep breath from across the room. The judge just watched me. I explained. Every time my ex-wife talks to me, she asks for money. Since we got divorced, I haven't touched the bank account. I'm tired of arguing about it, so I will give it to Mackenzie under the terms we just discussed. I can't handle the sadness that hits me every time I talk to my daughter. I spoke clearly, 
but I felt tears running down my face. I can't bear the thought of whether I will see the caring girl I raised or the young woman who insults me and calls me names. Still, even now, after so much hurt, part of me wants to run to her, hug her, and tell her how much I love her. I heard Mackenzie crying. If I looked around the room, I saw that most people, even Carol, had tears in their eyes. Your Honor, I cannot move on with my new life if I keep looking back. These women have hurt me, but I know I can heal if I let go. My new life with my new family is waiting for me. But if I can do this last thing for that young woman over there, the girl I used to call my daughter and keep the jerk Stephen Morrison away from that money, I think I can find some peace. My life would be so different if he had not distracted my ex-wife. I would still be divorced, but I might still have a relationship with Mackenzie. Anyway, this is my offer to Mackenzie. Thank you. I finished. I turned away, took a tissue from Kim, and wiped my eyes. The judge cleared his throat. Do you want to say anything more, counselor? Kim also cleared her throat. Yes, your honor. We have set 30 days from today for Miss Mackenzie Morrison to accept the agreement. If she does not accept the offer in that time, it will be canceled, and my client will keep the money. I think that is fair, the judge replied with a nod. In the case of emotional hurt, I conclude this in favor of Mr. Terry Other, with no money owed by either side. Each side will pay its own legal fees. In the case of financial difficulties, I again conclude in favor of Mr. Terry Other, also with no money owed by either side, and each side will cover its own legal costs. The financial offer for Miss Mackenzie Morrison is noted, but it is outside the reach of this court. In my closing statement, I wanted to speak to Mrs. Carol Morrison. Mrs. Morrison, may I have your attention? Carol straightened up. Yes, Your Honor. Mrs. Morrison, I don't often address people in the audience, but I believe I need to give you a warning. In every interaction you have with your husband, your daughter, or your ex-husband, much of what is recorded shows you in a negative light. Many of the issues that have arisen are directly or indirectly due to your actions. You think you are in a very tough financial situation, but I feel that's not quite right. Carol swallowed hard. I can't tell you how to live your life, but I think you should really think about your current situation and your daughter's too. It might be best to stay away from your ex-husband from now on, no matter what your daughter decides to do with the university funds. Let him move on. He seems happy. You also need to find some happiness for yourself. Yes, yes, Your Honor, Carol said. That is just advice, Mrs. Morrison, the judge said, looking around the room. Well, this has been interesting, but I really hope I don't see any of you back here again. This court is now closed. With that, we were finished. Kim took the agreement to Mackenzie's lawyer, and we left. At the cafe, we found Paul and the girls waiting for news. I was feeling a bit sad after court, so Kim shared most of the details, including my heartfelt words at the end. My wives were proud of me and hugged me tightly, whispering sweet things in my ear every few minutes. We talked for about an hour, and at one point, Kim noticed Carol and Mackenzie leaving the courthouse. Their ex was not with them. They were far away, but they looked tired and worn out. I completely understood how they felt. Our honeymoon was wonderful. During those ten days, I got to know my wives better. We were relaxed and comfortable with each other, and I appreciated every moment. We wore very little most of the time, and when we did, they looked great in their swimsuits, drawing attention from everyone around. I felt proud to be with them, walking tall with a beautiful redhead on each arm. After our trip, I almost forgot about my past life. Mackenzie had signed the agreement, so Kim took care of everything and moved the money into the trust. She asked if I wanted to know what course Mackenzie would choose at the university, but I said no. I felt that part of my life was over. Two months later, we learned that both my wives were pregnant. They had stopped taking birth control a month before the wedding without telling me. Soon, they both started feeling sick in the mornings. After some doctor visits, I found out I was going to be a father again, twice. My parents, William and Martha, were thrilled. I got teased and congratulated equally at work. We were all surprised when we went for the 12-week scan. Both of my wives were pregnant with twins. I wasn't sure how we would manage with four babies all at once, but as I cuddled with my girls that night, I knew we would get through it together. Kim and Paul were shocked. Kim teased me for weeks about being so lucky to have two girls pregnant with twins. 
She also told us that she and Paul were expecting again, which meant Candace would have a sibling along with her new cousins. So we were now looking at five new babies in the family. The only worry we had was that my mom was getting weaker. Her cancer was getting worse, and we were all concerned. Harmony spoke to many doctors, and before mom got too sick to travel, we visited three cancer doctors, one in Brisbane and two in Sydney. After reviewing her medical records, they all suggested making her comfortable and continuing her treatment at the local hospital. At that time, we all convinced mom and dad to move to Bathurst. This way, they could be near us and help with the babies once they were born. It also meant we could be closer to mom for support. By the time the girls were six months pregnant, we had mom and dad settled into a small home about 15 minutes away. Dad found part-time work with a local builder, and mom usually had someone with her day and night. We also talked Kim and Paul into moving nearby. They found a house close to mom and dad's place. Kim was a few weeks ahead of the pregnant ladies and was often grumpy. While Paul and I handled most of the moving, Kim scolded us whenever something was out of place. She was getting ready for the baby. My niece Candace thought it was all a fun adventure. She was starting to speak in full sentences and found it funny when her mom asked dad to move the same box to three different rooms all in a few minutes. She loved to rub the pregnant bellies of her mom and aunts and feel the baby's kick. Both Melody and Harmony were growing quickly, and Kim was quite big too, since she was ahead of them. I should mention that the air conditioning in the house was very cold. It reminded me of a scene from Father of the Bride, Part 2, where Steve Martin keeps changing clothes when going in and out of the house. All three pregnant ladies loved the cold, so we made sure to keep the place cool all day long. Towards the end, it was one of the few times my wives didn't cuddle with me at night. It wasn't because they didn't want to, it was just hard for them. Each night, I would snuggle with each of them in our bed, and we would hold hands until we fell asleep, waiting for the babies to arrive. When the time came, everything happened quickly. As I mentioned before, the twin connection was strong, and my girls felt it during labor, too. At 38 weeks, they both went into labor just two hours apart. Since they were having twins, we all agreed it was safer for Melody to have a C-section. The two mothers were prepared in the operating rooms next to each other while I walked between them, feeling very nervous. The first baby to arrive was my son, Adam. He had a big head of brown hair and a loud, healthy cry that any father would be proud of. Next came my sweet daughter, Grace. She was quiet and bald, but her bright green eyes stood out right away. After her was our third daughter, Beth, also from Melody. Like Adam, she had a strong voice, too. Lastly, my second son, John, was born. We had planned to call him Colin, but he looked so much like my father that we decided to name him after him. Three days later, Kim went into labor and gave birth to Candace's little sister, Holly. We would be raising a big family together, and even though it would be chaotic, I knew I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. I nearly regretted saying that during the first six months. With four little ones to care for, no one was getting any sleep. There were always diapers to change, and the girls were constantly feeding the babies. We nearly drove each other crazy, but around six months in, all four of them started sleeping through the night, and we found a routine. Our closeness came back strong. The kids were nearly two years old when we lost Mum. She held on as long as she could, and we were right there with her every day. In her final days, she spent as much time with her grandkids as possible, showering them with love even when she was weak. I hope the kids remember her fondly as they grow up. There's a wall of photos down the hallway of Mom with all six grandchildren. Dad felt sad but proud. Mom fought every step of the way and never gave up. We knew it was getting close when she asked the five of us to come visit one Saturday afternoon. We spent that day as we always did, sharing jokes and remembering our childhood. We laughed about the craziness of raising six kids at once. I think Mom realized it was time because she asked my wives for a few moments alone with each of us. She held Melody and Harmony tightly, even though her body was very frail. I love you both so much, my beautiful daughters. You have made my Terry so happy, I never thought I would see joy in his heart again after what Carol did to him. But you both came into his life like a storm and mended his heart so well. I can never thank you enough. They shared more words of love, and my wives were in tears when they came out. Then Kim went in with Paul while I held my girls who were quietly watching a movie in the background. 
A few minutes later, Paul came out with tears in his eyes, asking me to go in. I sat on the bed beside Mom. Kim was already in tears, holding our mom tightly like a little girl again. Oh, my dear ones, Mom said softly, her voice weak. I love you both so much. I don't think any parent could be prouder than I am of you two. I've watched you grow, and I love how you've always stayed close, even as adults. You have learned to care for each other during hard times. But there's something I need to ask you both. Yes, Mom, anything, I replied while Kim kept hugging Mom, afraid she would fade away. I need you to take care of your dad. He's trying to stay strong, but he needs your help through what's coming. He has many years left, and I don't want him to suffer. Your father is my true love, and I will always be with him. Even death can't break our bond. We all started crying. I thought back to a few years ago when Mom asked me something similar. Even now, it was hard to watch her suffer from the cancer, yet her thoughts were still with my dad. Now promise me, you two, look after your father. We cried, holding on to mom. We promise, mom, we will, Kim said through her tears. We shared a few more moments of pure family love. Then mom asked to talk to me alone. Kim dried her eyes, patted my shoulder, and stepped out of the room. Mom pulled me closer, and I held her gently as she leaned into me. Oh, my boy, my wonderful Terry, I have loved seeing the man you've become. You're slow to anger, and even then you are a good man. Even when Carol and Mackenzie hurt you, you always tried to do the right thing. I shook my head. Not always, Mom. There were times... She cut me off. I know, Terry. None of us are perfect, not even your mother. Really? I thought you were St. Josephine. She chuckled, though I could hear the struggle in her breath. No, not always. Your father and I have never told anyone this, but before you and Kim were born, we had a rough time. I was surprised to hear this. Your dad worked long hours after we bought our first house. I was a bank teller, but he wasn't home much, not even on weekends. So when some assistant manager started paying me attention, I admit I was flattered. I was taken aback. Had mom ever thought about being unfaithful? She must have seen my expression and smiled softly. No, I never cheated on your father, but things could have gone that way if something hadn't happened at a gathering weeks later. That was when I noticed Cindy Phillips trying to get close to your dad. He wasn't really pushing back, and Cindy noticed me watching. She smiled, placed her hand on dad's shoulder, and acted like she might take him away from me. You see, Cindy also worked at the bank and had seen the assistant manager joking with me. So she thought if I could have fun, she could try to win over my handsome husband. What did you do? I asked. Well, I dropped everything and told him to take me home and show me he cared. It made me laugh. Mom rarely used strong words, but for a moment she seemed lost in thought. Her eyes returned to me and she smiled. I'm happy to say he did, and he did it so well that your sister was born nine months later. A couple of years later, you came along too. But if it hadn't been for Cindy, giving me that smile and resting her hand on your father's shoulder while I watched, our lives could have turned out very differently. We both paused, thinking about how certain moments can change everything in life. Mum continued, Terry, I know you may never forgive Carol, and maybe you shouldn't. But what about Mackenzie? Do you think you could find it in your heart to forgive my granddaughter? I looked at my mother, who was very weak and swallowed hard. I don't know, Mum. I haven't really thought about it for a couple of years. She hurt me deeply, and I'm not sure how I would feel if I saw her again. She nodded. Terry, please consider it. I'm not asking you to find her and bring her back into your life. You have so much happening right now with your foreign Kims, too, that I doubt reaching out to Mackenzie would be sensible. Then she smiled. By the way, did you know Kim is expecting again? Yeah, she told me this morning. I smiled back. It makes me happy to think about all my grandchildren. At one time, I thought Mackenzie would be my only one. I know, Mom. I won't promise anything, but I will do my best if I ever see her again. She patted my arm gently. That's all I can ask, dear, just that. Then Dad spent some time with Mom and came back with mixed emotions, smiling and crying. It's not long now, everyone. She knows it and has asked us all to be with her, he said. Paul, Kim, Melody, Harmony, Dad, and I gathered around Mom on the bed. We shared stories and bad jokes for the next hour. The kids ran in and out, giving hugs to their grandmother. They didn't understand what was happening, but they knew Grandma was unwell. There were moments of laughter and moments of tears as the afternoon went on. 
gentle touches between my mother and us showed our love for her. She quietly slipped away from us while we were chatting about Kim's new baby. They thought it was going to be a boy. We heard mom laugh about it and say it was going to be a boy. Then we all looked at her smiling, but the light had left her eyes. Her breathing had stopped, but she looked calm, even though the presence that made her a mother was gone. The rare bone cancer that had taken over her body was harsh, but it never took away her spirit. Josephine Marie Other was quiet and often shy, but she always loved us deeply. That evening we all cried together, leaning on each other as we mourned. Just over a year later, Kim had given birth to Joseph, named after our mom. We were enjoying a family barbecue on a warm spring Saturday. Dad was there with us too. He had been sad for months after Mom passed away, but one day he decided to try to live again. He said Mom wouldn't have wanted him to be miserable for the rest of his life. Dad, Paul, and I were bringing in the hot food, while the kids sat at the big family table like a hungry group when I noticed the two unexpected guests. Most of us were lost in our thoughts when the two women came in. The metal tray hitting the floor snapped everyone back to reality, and they all turned to look at me. Um, hi, Terry. Carol, my ex-wife, said as she directed her tired eyes at me. She looked worn out, and over the years she had gained weight in a way that did not suit her. Her once beautiful figure was now covered in extra pounds. I, on the other hand, had stayed fit, maybe even more so since we last met, judging by the way she looked at me. It was clear she had no idea how we would react to her being here uninvited, but it wouldn't be a joyful reunion. Our other visitor also greeted me. Hi, Daddy. Mackenzie, my ex-daughter, added before I could say anything. She had her head down, looking at me from under a well-used baseball cap, one I had given her when she turned 13. Mackenzie didn't resemble the girl who had hurt and left me years ago. Instead, she seemed fragile, much like her mother. For what felt like a long minute, we all just stared at each other. The only sound was the kids at the table, but even they sensed the tension and began to notice the two strangers blocking their dinner. I sighed, bent down to pick up the food tray I had dropped, and turned to place it on the table. I signaled to Martha, who immediately recognized who they were and was glaring at them. Martha, could you please get the kids some food? I think this might take a few minutes. She stopped scowling at Carol and Mackenzie, her expression softening as she looked at me. Martha understood my pain very well. She had been by my side through most of my struggles over the years, and she probably knew just how I felt at that moment. My mother-in-law was one of the smartest women I knew. If you crossed her family, you would not only have problems with Martha, but also with her many friends and community members. I could tell that Carol and Mackenzie had felt her anger more than once, even if I didn't know the details. At that moment, Martha focused entirely on making sure all the kids were fed, pushing thoughts of my past family aside. It's fine, Terry. You take care of what you need to. I'll handle the kids. I turned back to my ex-family and let my face show my frustration. For the kids' sake, I won't say what I really want to say right now. But you both need to understand that you are not welcome here. It was tough to keep my voice steady, and I almost shouted the last part. Carol looked upset but seemed to expect my reaction. Mackenzie looked like she might cry. At this point, Kim stood beside me. Melody and Harmony joined us on my other side. Melody took my hand, showing her support. She knew Carol and Mackenzie well, and she could sense how I was feeling. Carol sighed deeply and glanced at everyone in the room before her gaze settled on me again. There was a time long ago when I loved looking into her eyes. Now all I saw was sadness, pain, and regret, which surprised me. We know, Terry, but we really need to talk to you. Oh, no! The sound of a metal tray hitting the floor snapped everyone out of their thoughts, and they all looked at me. Hi, Terry, Carol said, looking worn out. She seemed tired, and over the years, she had gained weight in ways that didn't look good on her. Her once beautiful curves were now hidden under layers of extra weight. On the other hand, I was still in good shape, perhaps even more fit than before. When she looked at me, it was clear she hadn't expected a warm welcome for showing up uninvited. Our second visitor, Mackenzie, said, Hi, Daddy, before I could say anything. Her head was slightly down, and she looked at me from underneath a baseball cap I had given her when she was 13. Mackenzie didn't look anything like the girl who had hurt me years ago. 
Now she seemed fragile, just like her mother. For what felt like a long minute, we all just stared at each other. The only noise came from the kids at the table, but even they sensed something was off and started to notice the two unexpected guests stopping them from having dinner. With a sigh, I bent down to pick up the tray of meat I had dropped, turned around, and placed it on the table. I looked at Martha and signaled to her. She knew who they were and was staring at them with anger. Martha, could you get some food for the kids? I think this might take a while. She stopped staring at Carol and Mackenzie. Her expression softened when she looked at me. Martha understood my feelings better than most people in the room. She had been there for me through many tough times. She could sense what I was going through right now. My mother-in-law was very wise, and crossing her would upset not only Martha, but all her friends and community. I had a feeling Carol and Mackenzie had faced Martha's anger before, even when I wasn't around. Martha quickly changed her focus to taking care of the kids, pushing away thoughts of my past family for now. No problem, Terry. You handle what you need to. I'll take care of the kids. I turned back to my ex-family, my face turning into a frown. For the sake of the children here, I won't say everything I want to right now, but you both need to know that you are not welcome here. It was hard for me to keep my voice steady, and I nearly shouted. Carol looked upset, but it seemed like she expected my reaction while Mackenzie looked like she might cry. Kim came to stand beside me. Melody and Harmony stood on my other side. Melody held my hand, showing her support. Like her sister, Harmony knew these visitors and understood how I felt. Carol took a deep breath and looked around the room before focusing on me again. There was a time when I loved looking into those eyes. Now, all I saw was pain, regret, and sadness. It surprised me. We know, Terry, but we need to talk to you. Oh no, I never thought my ex-family would come to see me here in Bathurst. First, the legal paper said Mackenzie had to stay away if she wanted her trust money for school. Also, both of these women had blamed me for their problems, even though they made bad choices when I was around. As I said before, Carol didn't look good. Unlike my wives, Melody and Harmony, she seemed to have stopped taking care of herself. Her face had many lines and her body was not appealing anymore. Looking at her now, she reminded me of a potato more than a fit mom in her late forties. Overall, she looked like someone who had given up. On the other hand, Mackenzie, my former daughter, had lost a lot of weight. She looked really thin in many ways. Her skin seemed to hang a bit, and each move she made looked a little stiff or hard for her. She didn't have the energy of a woman in her twenties. No, I wasn't sure either of these women would just show up at my door without any reason. Given how they seemed and all our talks over the years, I thought they were probably looking for money. For the last few years, Carol's new husband and Mackenzie's adopted dad, Stephen Morrison, who we called the jerk, had been in prison. He got 30 years for hurting me badly and trying to hurt me even more. I hated him deeply, and I knew he felt the same about me. Still, I could feel a bit of pity for him. My family thought he lost it because my ex-wife once had dreams about me while he was right there next to her. I looked around the room at everyone there. My beautiful wives, Melody and Harmony, my dad, John, my sister, Kim, and her husband, Paul, my in-laws, William and Martha, and my former family, Carol and Mackenzie, were all watching me, waiting for what would happen next. Focusing again on Carol and Mackenzie, old feelings came rushing back. I felt anger about how they had betrayed me, leaving me for another man because I wasn't good enough for them. Every time we talked, it felt disappointing as they threw insults my way. They often acted like they deserved money from me, which felt very unfair. I wanted to kick them out for being so broke and needy, but I felt something stop me. Even with my feelings rising, this was my home. I counted to ten and thought about what to do next while they stared at me. I sighed and said, Come on, let's go sit outside and get this done. I turned to Martha and Paul. Martha and Paul, can you watch the kids and make sure they are fed while we talk outside? Sure, Terry, Paul replied as he sat down next to his daughter, Candace, and my son, Adam. Together, we had seven kids. I had two sets of twins, one set with my wife, Harmony, and one set with my partner, Melody. To add to the twist, Melody and Harmony are identical twins. As far as we knew, it was rare for twins to have two sets of twins from the same dad. Some medical journals had written about us in the last few years. 
We talked with them, but decided against going public or doing interviews. I love my wives and kids and didn't want to put them through the madness that could come with the media. We all walked out back and sat at the big family table on our deck. The garden lights were shining brightly, and the fresh smell of cut grass filled the air. It made everything feel calm and pleasant. I took a seat at the big table. Melody was to my right, and Harmony was to my left, just as usual. Across from me sat Carol and Mackenzie, while Kim took a spot at one end of the table. A little while later, Dad and William came out, bringing water and glasses for everyone. They made sure Melody and I had some drinks and gave wine to Harmony. Then they went back inside to help with the kids, knowing we needed some privacy. Harmony poured drinks and made sure everyone had one before she sat back down and waited. After a few moments, Carol began to speak. Terry, your place is lovely. I didn't expect... She paused, realizing she was slipping back into old habits of putting me down. Melody looked at Carol with a sharp gaze and spoke for me. Thank you, it is a wonderful place, and it's been in the family for many years. Now that Terry is our husband, he is part of that family too. Carol and Mackenzie looked at me in surprise. Our husband? Carol asked, confused. I know Terry remarried, so which one of you married him? I chuckled and said, Carol, I'd like you to meet my wife, Mrs. Melody Other. I gestured to her and she smiled proudly. Congrats you, Carol started. I cut in, and I'd also like to introduce you to my other wife, Mrs. Harmony Other. Yes, you heard right. I'm married to both of these wonderful women. Carol was taken aback while Mackenzie stared in shock. Melody, Harmony, and I simply smiled, and Kim chuckled. After glancing between us, Carol looked at Kim, who nodded in understanding. Oh yes, Carol. After you hurt him, my little brother saved both of these amazing women when they were in great danger. They fell in love with him, so he married them both. Your ex-husband is very much in love with them, and now they have twins with each of these lovely women, my older sister said with a laugh, and I could hear the hint of what she meant in her tone. Mackenzie finally found her voice. So you mean you're close with both of them? She asked, trying to understand. Yes, Mackenzie, Harmony replied with a giggle. Your former father is very close to both of us. Since the very first night, he has shown us his love and care without holding back. He is our support and gives everything he can without asking for anything in return. Mackenzie said, I can't believe you and your mom would ever leave such a caring man. She felt her face get warm. Melody jumped in, eager to agree. He is such a good dad, Mackenzie. He really cares for those kids like they are everything to him. Harmony and I couldn't ask for a better man to show our kids how to treat others in this tough world. He lives for them. We just don't understand why you let him go. Carol interrupted, her voice sharp. That's because you see him now. She pointed at the house and garden. He has money and a good name. When we were his family, he was just a plumber. Even after all these years, Carol still didn't understand. Harmony shot back, her words hurtful. You really don't get it, do you, Carol? Carol looked shocked as if she had been hit. We would cherish Terry no matter what he had. When we first met him and fell in love, all he had was what was in his truck. To Terry, money doesn't matter. He treats us like royalty because he loves us and we've given him our hearts. We would leave this behind, she waved her hand like Carol did, if it meant we could keep him. We know that he, our husband, the man you let go, would do anything for us, even give his life. He almost did that night we met. But can you say the same, Carol? Would you ever step out of your comfort zone for your family? Harmony stood firm, glaring at Carol. Carol looked ready to flee. You had a man who would give you everything, and he did, Melody continued. And you know he knows how to make us happy in more ways than one. Oh, Carol, don't pretend you don't know he can please you, too. Melody smiled and Harmony joined in a soft sound of affection toward me. Carol's face turned bright red. Mackenzie tried to look anywhere but at us, and Kim laughed from her side of the table. Then Kim spoke up. Okay, everyone, I know we could talk about my brother's skills all night, but let's focus back on Carol and Mackenzie. We all turned to look at the embarrassed women across from me. There's a reason you're here tonight. But first, can you tell us how you found us? This address is private. And how did you get past the gate? My sister asked. Mom and I drove to Bathurst last week, Mackenzie said slowly. We watched your office to see when you came and went over the past few days. When we saw Dad's truck, we followed it back here. 
Tonight, as we drove in, Pa had just arrived, so we came in right after him before the gate shut. A bit strange, but it brought you here, Kim said. But still, why are you here? She paused and added, Mackenzie, your trust agreement says you can't contact Terry. You have to know he doesn't want to see you. My brother has been working hard to move on without you two, and I think it's been almost a year since he thought about either of you. About eight months, Kim, I replied, my voice shaking a bit. The girls know I take off every year on Mackenzie's birthday to sit on this deck and remember what was lost. I couldn't look at Mackenzie, and as always, thinking of her made a tear roll down my cheek. We let him have a quiet hour or two out here to think. He sits with his drink and just stares off into space. But when the sun goes down, he comes back in and takes care of us like he does every other day, Melody explained. She glanced at Carol and Mackenzie, and her look wasn't exactly hatred, but it was close. I dared to look at Mackenzie. She was staring at me, tears welling in her eyes. After all these years, despite trying to move on, I felt the flickers of love for her come back inside me. I quickly looked away, not wanting to feel anything for her. I wouldn't let her or her mother disrupt the life I had built with my girls. My wives held my hands tighter, sensing my inner struggle. So what brings you here, Carol and Mackenzie? Kim asked, noticing the tension. They exchanged looks. We didn't have many options, Carol said, looking down. Things have been tough for the last few years. In fact, they've been really bad. She glanced around, hoping for some sympathy, but we all remained quiet, waiting for her to continue. She took a deep breath. After Stephen's sentencing, I understood we would never be together again. He would be in prison for a long time, so I divorced him. It took a few months, but his lawyers forced us out of the house since it was his before we got married. We got a little money, but not much. And since then, Mackenzie and I have been living in a small, two-bedroom place on the edge of Maitland. Are you looking for pity, Carol? Kim asked. No, Kim, Carol said quickly, sounding genuinely sorry. After that last day in court, when Mackenzie found out what Stephen had done to Terry, she broke down. I knew I had ruined any chance of fixing things with Terry. There was no way for us to make things right. I heard that day that he had remarried, but I never expected that he had married both of you. She managed a weak smile. Even when I was at my best, I couldn't compete with either of you, let alone both of you. Honestly, my best days are behind me. She sighed again, hoping for sympathy but getting none. After that day, I realized that I not only ruined my relationship with a man who gave me everything, but I also hurt Terry's relationship with Mackenzie. Her smile faded as she stared blankly into space. I could say I was pushed by Stephen and that he was the real troublemaker. But deep down, I know that's not true. I could have divorced Terry and married Stephen while helping Mackenzie stay close to her dad. But I felt the need to break Terry because if I didn't, I could never truly be with Stephen. Why? I asked, my voice shaky. I was curious for the first time since all of this started. I wished I wasn't, but I was. For the first time in many years, I felt Carol really look at me, not just to see what she could get from me, but to see if she cared about what I thought. She sighed. Because I still love you, Terry. I knew if I didn't hurt you, I might want you back someday. The time with Stephen was exciting, but he only cared about himself. He wasn't able to have kids and was really not much to look at. Her weak smile came back as she spoke. I could feel my wives wanting to shout, and I did too, but I held their hands as they held mine, and they stayed quiet. Carol continued. You were right that day in front of the courthouse, Terry, when you said I dreamed of you. I dreamed of you taking me back and being with me like we did when we were young. She quickly glanced at her daughter. I'm sorry, Mackenzie, but it's true. I dreamed that your father would take me back, forgive me, and be with me forever. In my dreams, I didn't care about his job. I just wanted to feel loved. Sadly, Stephen never truly loved us. To him, we were just things to make him look better. Those were my dreams. But when I woke up, the awful person I had become woke up too, and suddenly I was Mrs. Stephen Morrison, and I had to destroy Terry again. So, Stephen fueled that way of thinking, and I didn't realize it was my moans in my dreams that drove him to snap. I had little sympathy for her and she knew we would never fix things. But I have to admit it answered some questions in my mind. So, you're divorced and living in a small apartment in Maitland. Can you explain why you're here? 
I asked. Well, she said, I know we messed up our chances for a relationship with you. After my divorce from Stephen, I had to stop Mackenzie a few times from reaching out to you, or she would lose her trust fund. That money helped us pay for our apartment while I held a job at a local real estate office. We were doing all right, not amazing, but better together as mother and daughter. We thought we might never talk to you again. But about six months ago, Mackenzie started feeling very tired. She would come home and just collapse. After some doctor visits, we found out she has a rare type of bone cancer. She stopped, letting the news sink in. Is it the same as what my mom had? I asked, clenching my jaw. Yes, Terry. We didn't know at first, but it is. We ended up going to the same specialist as your mother, and about three months ago, he figured out that you are Mackenzie's biological father. Mackenzie looked at me with worry in her eyes. She was sitting with me but didn't know how to talk to me. She needed something. So what do you need, Carol Mackenzie? Is this about more money? I said, getting frustrated. Even with the terrible impact of cancer and watching my mother suffer, I was angry that it all seemed to come back to money with these two. Harmony put a hand on my arm before I could say more. No, honey, I don't think it's money they want this time. I believe they need you. Me? I asked Harmony, looking confused. Carol nodded in response. Harmony seemed to connect the dots. Yes, Terry, remember when Josephine was in her last days? They were looking at a new treatment for this cancer that needed a bone marrow transplant along with some treatments that could help fight the cancer with chemotherapy. Right, Carol? Yes, that's correct, Carol said softly. Harmony nodded. While our budget for Mackenzie's care is tight, we can manage. After everything that's happened between us, you might think I'm very selfish. But Mackenzie wouldn't let me ask you for money. I wouldn't ask unless it was truly needed. But for the procedure, we wanted to see if you would agree to tests to check if you are a match to donate bone marrow for Mackenzie's treatment. There it was. My daughter. Someone who had hurt me. Needed my help. There was a chance to save her life. I looked at Mackenzie, and she looked back at me, fear clear in her eyes. She was scared I might say no to the test, but also scared I might reject her completely. After everything that had happened, I could understand her fear that I might never accept her again. I really didn't know what to think. We sat in silence for a few minutes, lost in our own thoughts. Melody gently traced her fingers on my hand, and Harmony held me close, sharing her strength with me. Kim, I said, looking at my sister, could you take Carol and Mackenzie inside for a few minutes? I need to talk with my wives. Of course, little brother. Come on, Carol and Mackenzie. She walked them inside. Well, my loves, what do you think? I asked as the door closed behind them. Mackenzie is definitely not well, Harmony said, watching them go. Her skin is pale and she looks a bit weak. She has signs of being very sick, similar to what your mom had. She frowned, knowing those words would be hard for me to hear. Yes, when I saw her last, she did not look good. But what I really meant is, what do you think I should do? I asked. Baby, Melody said, I understand. They both hurt you deeply, and honestly, I felt like I wanted to jump across the table when your ex-wife spoke. But she still has feelings for you. She sighed heavily. However, your little girl is sick. No matter what she did, there's a chance to help her. Would you really turn your back on her just because of how you feel? She was right. I couldn't let my feelings stop me from helping someone in need. I sighed again. No, I wouldn't. When I look at her, I see my little girl scared and hurting. I thought I had moved on from this, but I haven't. I wrapped my arm around my wives. But I can't do this without you both. I'm not strong enough. We're here for you, our love, Harmony said. Neither Melody nor I want you to go through this alone, but I think you need to do one important thing first. What is it? I asked. I think it's important for you to talk with Mackenzie, just the two of you, Melody added, and Harmony nodded in agreement. I felt panic rising. This was not something I wanted to do, at least not now. No, I can't. I'm not sure if I can face that. Terry, my love, Melody said softly as she hugged me. We know you can. You need to do this. What about Carol? I asked, hoping to change the subject. Forget about Carol, Melody said sharply, all her kindness fading. She deserves everything for what she did to you. Then her expression softened. But Mackenzie is still your daughter, 
I know it's hard, but she might need your help to fight this illness. Shouldn't you at least consider trying? I looked at her and sighed. That feels unfair, Melody, bringing Mom into this. She blushed a bit, but shrugged. I may not like Mackenzie much. Talking to her on the phone made that clear. But that doesn't mean I want to see her suffer and fade away. Good point. Harmony? I turned to my other wife. Do you agree with your sister? She nodded. I do, sweetie. You should talk to Mackenzie first. You got some kind of closure with Carol that day outside the court, but not with Mackenzie. Honestly, I don't think either of you had the chance to really talk. We sat quietly for a few minutes. I thought there was no better time than now. Okay, could you both ask her to come out and join me? Both of them stood up and gave me a quick kiss. I watched them walk back into the house. Finally, I got up, finished my drink, and moved two chairs to the edge of the porch. I sat back down, thinking about what would happen next while looking out at the backyard. A few minutes later, I heard the back door open again. I heard soft footsteps behind me, and then Mackenzie sat down next to me. I turned to her, and she offered me a drink. Kraken and Coke, Melody told me to give this to you. She said your other drink would be empty. I took it and thanked her. She was holding a juice. You don't drink? I asked. Not anymore. I can't because of my medication. But when I turned 18, I started drinking rum and Coke like you. I usually went for Bundy because I couldn't afford Kraken. I laughed softly and looked back at the garden. Rum, huh? She sighed. I know this sounds bad after everything I did to you, but I knew you liked rum. At first I didn't like it, but I drank it because I felt like I had a little piece of you with me when I did. I took a sip of my rum, enjoying the taste of the Kraken while she sipped her juice. We sat in silence. It was a bit awkward, but we were deep in our own thoughts. I broke the quietness. So what are you studying at school? She hesitated for a moment before answering. I had to drop out this year because of my treatment, but I was studying applied mathematics. I wanted to get a job in crypto or data modeling in IT, things like blockchain applications. For the first time in years, I laughed at what she said, not in anger, but just because it was funny. You know, I don't really understand much of what you just said. She laughed back, though she followed it with a small cough similar to when mom coughed. She looked at me, her eyes searching mine. Then, taking a deep breath, she said, I really messed everything up, didn't I, Dad? My heart raced at the word Dad. I felt a mix of emotions just talking to her. My mind told me to stay calm and not let my feelings take over. Before I could think too much, I replied, Yes, Pumpkin, you really did. Tears she had been holding back started to flow and she began to cry. The last time I called her Pumpkin was the morning they both left me. I just sat there as she cried. I sipped my rum, looking out at the backyard. Inside, my heart was breaking, but I tried to stay calm on the outside. After a few minutes, Mackenzie started to feel better. She wiped her tears and tucked her hair behind her ears. Her voice was soft, and she seemed to be talking to herself more than to me. I had to lean in to hear her. I must be one of the dumbest daughters in the world. I wasted so many years on a mother who only cared about her clothes and a man who only used me to show off. She glanced over at me when she noticed I was listening, and she raised her voice a bit. And look where that got me, right into sadness. I haven't been happy in years, and now that I need my real father, not some fake one, he wants nothing to do with me. I couldn't help but chuckle, and she did too, just from hearing me laugh. What's so funny? she asked, but her face turned serious. I laughed again, thinking back to the last time she asked me that. Mackenzie, I never stopped loving you even if it felt like I did at times. There were so many things that you and your mother did and said that made me question if you were really my daughter. She looked like she wanted to run away after I said that. I raised my hand to signal her to wait. But I always loved you. Right now, Mackenzie, I'm scared. I'm scared that if I open my heart to you, you'll hurt it again like you did a long time ago. Then why are you laughing? She asked quietly, looking down. Because you called him a Morrison. We rarely use his real name here, and when the kids aren't around, that's what we call him. She laughed, and a light came into her eyes, but then she grew serious. Did he really try to hurt you? I nodded and took another sip of my drink. So even after that court day, your mother never told you what happened? She shook her head. No, I asked, but she wouldn't say. I don't think she knows the whole story, 
and I think she believes it's partly her fault. She should, I said firmly. Then I sighed. I really don't like your mother at all, Mackenzie. What I'm about to tell you might make you angry with me again, but I've never lied to you, and I won't start now, okay? She nodded, looking scared again. Okay, Dad. I looked at her and saw her eyes for the first time in years. They were brown like mine, but now there was a hint of gray in them, likely from her illness or its treatment or maybe both. I sighed once more. Mackenzie, to be honest, I don't think your mother ever truly loved me. I doubt she really understands what love feels like. She says she does, but I don't see it in how she cares for someone. When we first got together in high school, we had so much fun that everyone thought we would end up closer, and we did. You were born from that, and then we got married. I'm not sure that was the best choice. Mackenzie looked at me, confused. I always planned to be a plumber. It's in my family. I grew up around plumbing, and I still help the team at Della T's when I can. Your mom knew this, and I thought she loved me like I loved her, but then things changed. Suddenly, I wasn't good enough anymore, and she moved on without thinking. And even worse, she took you with her. So when it comes to love? No, I don't think she understands it at all. I glanced at Mackenzie, then looked out at the garden, taking a sip of my drink. But your mom and I did have 15 good years. During that time, I loved her completely, but it didn't work because she never understood what love truly means and always held back. What do you mean, Dad? What did she hold back? I answered without stopping. Her acceptance. Mackenzie looked at me, waiting for more. I didn't realize what that meant until I met Melody and Harmony. My girls accepted me for who I am, the good and the bad. When I was happy, they celebrated with me. When I was sad, they hugged me tight and about other feelings. Well, I smiled a little. Maybe too much information, Mackenzie said, but she smiled back. But your mother never accepted me. I think she cared in her own way only when it fit into her plans, but she never accepted all of me. Even if I had become a lawyer or had a big business, I still believe we would have ended up divorced because she couldn't be happy with what we had. On that day when everything changed, I almost gave up after seeing what you both had done. I could accept that Carol was leaving, which hurt, but you chose to leave me and wanted someone else as your father. I felt tears welling up but took a deep breath to hold them back. Mackenzie looked at me, then shook her head. She seemed close to tears, too. That doesn't excuse what we did, Dad. There's no reason for it. I was just 15 and doing what I was told. But at 15, I should have known better. I could have questioned it even if I didn't. She didn't cry, but I could sense her shame as she lowered her head and continued. When Mom and that man first told me about moving in with him, I was upset. I didn't know how I could live with him and still have you as my dad. For weeks, they told me how great it would be. They said you would be okay, even better without us. They kept saying we would have lots of new clothes and pretty things. Mom said I had to keep it a secret until we moved, so I did. I liked shiny things, but they were not everything to me back then. I foolishly trusted Mom. After we moved, I asked Mom and the new man to take me to see you, but after a few weeks of them ignoring me, they said I couldn't see you until he adopted me. Mom was nervous, twisting her hands, but she kept talking. I just sipped my drink and looked out at the gardens. I might have been a little naive, but I knew something was off. Still, Mom and the new man kept giving me things. They bought me new clothes and pretty jewelry to fill the empty space from not seeing you. We went out and saw parts of the city I had never seen. In the first six months, I made three trips to Sydney as they tried to make me happy. At night in my room, I missed you and cried because I thought you didn't want me. I could feel my armor breaking down as I listened to her, but there was also anger rising in me towards Mom and the new man. I softened my feelings only for Mackenzie and said, Oh, sweetie, that was never true. I wanted to see you but there was a restraining order that said I had to stay away from the new man, your mother, and you. If I had broken that law, I could have gone to jail. I thought you didn't want me, your mother. We sat quietly as I let that thought fade away. Mackenzie, I'm trying to understand. This is the first time we've really talked since everything changed years ago. I sat and thought, connecting bits of information, talks, and papers I had read over the years, and suddenly some things started to make sense. Can I ask you something? If you don't want to answer, that's okay. 
Dad, if you really want to know, no matter how much it hurts, I'll tell you if I can. Her voice was almost begging. A few months after I left, I came back to see your grandmother. You didn't know, but she had just gone through her first cancer treatment. You saw me in Maitland Central. Mackenzie looked down, clearly embarrassed. What happened? If you were so upset, why did you treat me like that? It took her a moment to respond. I could see shame and pain in her face, along with some anger towards me. Finally, she took a deep breath and found her calm. I recognized that we would have a lot to talk about. When I first saw you, you were laughing at something on your phone. It had been months since I had seen you. If you think back to the day we talked after the divorce, before you came here, I said as I nodded, we saw you by your truck that day and you really let both mom and me have it. I nodded again. I cried for days because I didn't get why you didn't want me to be your daughter. I was starting to understand that I had hurt you and pushed you away. But I was also upset because you just left. I wanted to speak, but Mackenzie noticed me take a breath and raised her hand to pause me. She shook her head. I know now you left because we hurt you so much. Just like Mum said before, and I'm truly sorry, the three of us tried to break you. Each of us for different reasons, but we did. It broke something in me when you hit your truck, showing how much I had hurt you. When you left, it never got better. Honestly, Dad, it's still not okay. But when I saw you in the cafe that morning and you were laughing, it felt like you were happy again. Watching you made me think I never mattered to you, so... It didn't seem fair. You were happy, and I was not. She tilted her head and asked, I know it might not matter, but can you tell me what made you laugh that day? I smiled slightly. Sure, I said as I pulled out my phone and looked through my photos. I found the picture of the girls. Melody and Harmony were taking care of me when I was recovering from an accident. I'll explain it later, but by the time they sent me this photo, they were both joking around with me. I showed Mackenzie the picture of the two girls smiling, covered by a sheet. Mackenzie grinned. You really got lucky with them. But then her smile faded as she continued her story. Anyway, seeing you there smiling made me feel worse because I was sad and knew Morrison and Mom were right behind me. They had been saying things about you running away from us, and I kind of lost it. Mom had only been married to Morrison for a short time, but he was putting you down at every chance. He called you names and said you were a terrible father and husband. Mom always agreed with him, so when I saw you happy, I got angry. I thought if I felt bad, you shouldn't feel good either. I'm sorry, Dad, I went too far. Yes, you did, I replied, feeling the weight of her words. She continued, her hurt so clear on her face. When we left and got home, Morrison was yelling about how he would ruin you. You had already caused him a lot of money when you walked out on him at the hospital with that couple. They were important because they gave a lot of money to the local hospital every year. If we lost their support, we would lose a lot of money, too. That couple was William and Matha, the parents of Melody and Harmony. Her eyes went wide. Did you know that back then? I shook my head and smiled. No, I met the girls later, but let's go back to you. You and your mom came to see me the next day, and it felt like you were a completely different person. You were more the Mackenzie I knew, not the mean girl I saw at the cafe. What changed? She nodded. I felt terrible that night and cried myself to sleep again. I realized I had hurt you again, but when I heard Mom say she was going to my grandparents to get my university money from you, I begged to go with her. All I wanted was to say I was sorry. I wanted to escape the mess my life was becoming. She seemed lost in thought, and we both sat quietly for a moment, thinking about what had happened and its effects. Finally, unsure if Mackenzie would say anything, I spoke up. When you and your mom drove away, I hoped we could reconnect, but then your birthday came. Her voice was full of regret. I really messed that up too, didn't I? I let out a small laugh. Yes, you did. That's when I felt all the warmth and love I had for you fade away. I paused. Or so I thought. She looked at me, shaking a little. I wanted to comfort her, but I couldn't. Instead, we had to navigate through our memories to find if there was hope or not. Her voice trembled, but she spoke. I know, Dad. Back then I felt justified in how I acted. Now I just feel ashamed. At that time, the guy had only been home for a couple of days after getting out on bail. He and Mom were shouting your name, but for different reasons. They blamed you for all their problems. They also kept saying there wasn't much money anymore. 
I feel embarrassed to say that I got used to having new clothes, and Mom taught me to expect them. I didn't know he had tried to hurt you. She paused. He really did, didn't he? Yes, I said, shaking my head. And he almost succeeded. I almost died twice from what he used on me. My heart stopped twice in the emergency room. But I'm here now because of a wonderful medical team and some care from Harmony. So, Mackenzie, about the message you sent? She groaned, dreading to talk about her mistakes. Dad, I want to hear more about what he did, but I know this is about you. On my birthday, I saw your number and knew it was you. But just ten minutes earlier, Mom and the guy were shouting about you. When I listened to the message, I got angry, wondering how you could do this to us. Did you hate us that much? The jerk had been telling me that now I was 17, I could take you to court for money, so I sent the text. It was one of the worst things I've ever done. Until we were in that courtroom, I thought I was right, and you were just a bitter ex-father who wanted to get back at us. Her voice got quieter. I never knew the truth until that day in court. I never let myself see that we were wrong. I could hear the hurt in her voice. I never really thought I would lose you until I heard he tried to hurt you. At that point, I felt like I was falling apart. I remembered that day. Mackenzie started crying as we shared our story in court and kept crying even when the hearing was paused, and they took her and her mother into another hallway. She went on, sadness in every word. I didn't even hear about the offer in the trust fund until three days later when the lawyer he got for me tried to explain it. I just stared at you. I didn't hear anything. When I found out about the conditions, I lost it again. I told them I didn't want the deal. It was my mom who made me sign it. She said I had no chance of ever being loved by you again, so I should just take your money. She looked at me, watching her. I would have broken that agreement a million times just to hear you say my name and to have just one hug from you, Dad. I didn't care about the money. I just wanted to go back to when you loved me and I could be your daughter again. Then she broke down completely. Big sobs shook her small frame, tears streaming down her face. I just wanted to be your little girl. I just wanted my dad, she cried, hugging herself as she took shaky breaths and rocked back and forth, lost in her sadness. I watched her for a few minutes, trying to stay calm, keeping my face steady. But then I couldn't hold it in anymore. The love I had for my daughter, which had been cold for years, suddenly flared back to life, burning deep in my heart as I watched her cry. I reached over and with effort pulled her chair to mine, lifted her as if she were light as a feather, and held her close. Her cries turned into wails. I wrapped my arms around her and held her on my lap. She clenched my shirt as she sobbed for the next ten minutes. I rocked her back and forth, treating her like a child in my arms again, even though she was twenty-two. I didn't want to let her go, and tears streamed down my face, mixing with hers on the floor below us. She kept crying, Daddy! In that moment, I would not have let go for anything. Slowly, as the moon rose in the sky, our emotions began to fade. Our cries turned into sniffles, and Mackenzie lay there as I held her. She had calmed down and was gently leaning against me. Over the years since my journey began, I rarely imagined that I could hold my daughter again. It felt like a part of my heart had been healed. I closed my eyes while holding Mackenzie and swaying a little when Melody touched my shoulder. My wife smiled softly at me, filled with pride not only for me, but also for Mackenzie. I'm sorry, my love. I know this is special for you two, but the kids want to come and say goodnight. Mackenzie looked up at me, sniffed, and then smiled. She glanced at Melody, looking a bit anxious, but still managed to smile at me. It's okay, Dad. We both needed that. But if you need to put the kids to bed, promise me you'll come back so we can keep talking. I stood up. Melody said, I can stay here with her if you want. I looked at Mackenzie. Actually, Mackenzie, would you like to come with me and help tuck in your brothers and sisters? Both girls gasped. Dad, I don't know if I can. There's so much. I cut in. Yes, I know, sweetheart. But I would rather have you with me right now than here. We can keep talking after everyone is in bed. Melody helped us both up, and we walked back inside together. Everyone noticed us as we entered. We had been outside for nearly an hour, and it was clear that both my and Mackenzie's eyes were red from crying. Carol quickly stood up and walked towards us. It's great to see you two talking, she started. Carol, it's bedtime for the kids now, and Mackenzie and I still need to talk. 
She nodded. I understand, Terry. I can wait. I shook my head. Carol, this might take a while, and Mackenzie and I need to talk about important things. My family has been kind to help you for a bit. I think it's best if you head back to your hotel. She looked at Mackenzie, then back at me, ignoring everyone else. Okay, Terry. Mackenzie and I can come back tomorrow. I felt Mackenzie squeeze my arm tightly. I knew what to do. Sorry, Carol. What I mean is that Mackenzie and I want to keep talking tonight. You don't need to be here for that. Mackenzie can stay here tonight and we'll look after her. Carol looked upset, and I saw her previous annoyance return. What do you mean, Terry? My daughter needs me. I brought her here. You can't just throw me out. Why not? You tossed my amazing husband away like nothing, Harmony said, snapping her fingers and stepping into the room. She folded her arms as she leaned against the doorway, her eyes sharp as she looked at Carol, but she smiled warmly at me. Terry, the kids are ready for their story now. Don't take too long. Then she turned and walked away. I noticed her walk, and I could hear Melody laugh softly behind me. She knew what I was thinking. Mackenzie cleared her throat. Mom, it's okay. I'm not a kid anymore. I'm 22. Dad and his family will take care of me. We can meet in town tomorrow. Mackenzie straightened up but kept holding my hand. But right now I need to have this talk with Dad. It's been almost seven years and I can't let this chance slip away. But, Carol began to argue. No buts, Mom. You are not helping right now. With what Dad and I have been discussing, having you here will only make it harder. My ex-wife shot me a sharp look. What have you been telling her, Terry? Not much, Carol. In fact, Mackenzie has been talking a lot, but I think she sees things differently now. It's surprising how reflecting on the tough memories from when she was younger affects her today. I paused, letting that sink in for a moment. Carol's anger was growing. She probably thought that if she was asked to leave, Mackenzie would too. An hour ago, I thought that might happen, but now I felt hopeful. After our talk and heartfelt hugs, maybe I could reconnect with my daughter. Mackenzie spoke again. Mom, it's okay. I think you should leave so I can reconnect with Dad. I'll be fine. Without further argument, Mackenzie took her mother's arm and walked her out to the car before things got worse. I was reading The Very Hungry Caterpillar to the kids when Mackenzie returned, walking in with Melody. I paused and let Melody sit down next to me on my right side. Harmony was on my left, and to my surprise, Mackenzie sat down with the kids on the floor. By the end of the story, the kids were curious about who this new woman was. Adam, John, Grace, and Beth, this is your big sister, Mackenzie Morrison. She is my daughter from my first marriage before I met your mothers, I introduced her. Actually, it's Mackenzie Brown, she corrected me. I raised my eyebrows in surprise. We introduced Candace and Holly, her cousins, and for the next few minutes, the kids fired away with questions. They wanted to know how she could be daddy's daughter, but also a grown-up. If she was grown, did she have kids like the other adults they knew? Then young Grace asked the most awkward question. Sister Mackenzie, what's wrong with your hair? I had noticed earlier that Mackenzie hadn't taken off her hat all night, but we all gasped as she removed it now. Sewn into the hat I gave her when she was 13 was a wig made of brown hair. Underneath that wig, Mackenzie had no hair at all, a usual result of her cancer treatment. She touched Grace's arm and said, Grace, I'm really sick, and the medicine I have to take makes my hair fall out. Does it hurt? Adam asked. It hurts a little, Mackenzie smiled, but I try to stay brave. The kids kept asking questions about their new big sister until Kim walked into the room. She did a double take when she saw Mackenzie was bald, then quickly clapped her hands. All right, kids, that's enough. Give Mackenzie some space. You can talk to her in the morning. It's past your bedtime, so go to sleep. After the kids were tucked in bed, Mackenzie gave my dad a big hug. When he saw her bald head and realized she had the same cancer that mom had, I watched as he became emotional. He held his granddaughter for the first time in nearly seven years. They spoke quietly for a bit, then John, along with William and Martha, said goodnight and went to bed. Martha hugged me as she left and whispered, I know you're hurting again, Terry. I also see you're confused, but you're doing the right thing. She needs you to help her feel better. I nodded and hugged my mother-in-law tightly. Paul and Kim also said they would listen to the kids and let us have more time to talk. Melody, Harmony, Mackenzie, and I went outside and sat down together. 
Mackenzie, is it okay if we sit with you and your dad? Melody asked. Mackenzie nodded. Yes. Sorry, I can't tell you both apart. The girls laughed and Melody said, That's all right. Most people get confused too. I'm Melody and this is my sister Harmony. She leaned in and said in a whisper, If you want an easy way to remember us, I usually sit on his right side while Harmony always sits on his left. Why is that? Mackenzie asked. We told her the story of how we met during a storm. I showed her the scar on my arm that Harmony cared for when it first happened. She always looked after my left side, so that became her special side, and Melody took my right. So that's why I always sit on his left, Harmony finished. Mackenzie wiped tears from her eyes and looked at me. She could feel my pain, knowing how hard things had been for both her mother and herself. Then she looked at the three of us, tilting her head. So you three are married? Yes, we replied together, smiling at each other. So how does that work? my daughter asked. Do you sleep in the same room or separate rooms? How does dad decide? Oh no, sweetie, Harmony said. We all sleep in the same bed. From the moment we met, we always slept together. So how does it work? Do you know what I mean? She asked, feeling shy. The girls laughed. Are you talking about romance? Melody asked, sounding playful. My daughter turned red. Is that what you meant? Melody suddenly became serious as she leaned in closer to the table. Mackenzie, here's something you need to understand. Harmony and I both share your dad equally. There's no division between us. And just to be clear, we don't have any closeness with each other. But yes, we do work with your dad together, so we often see him at the same time. She sat back, smiled again, and looked at me, blowing a kiss. I caught it in my hand and pressed it to my cheek before blowing one back. Harmony reached out and caught my kiss in the air, bringing it to her cheek. You see, Melody said, looking at Mackenzie, like in a traditional marriage, we are very close, and my sister and I love your dad completely. So how do you handle the laws? Mackenzie asked, curious. I jumped in. Well, I am officially married to Harmony. That's what the government knows. But we also have a special agreement that we all sign to give Melody the same rights. It can't be registered like a normal marriage, even though it's all legal. Honestly, I don't understand all of it, but Aunt Kim could explain it to you. Mackenzie looked down a bit. I don't think Aunt Kim likes me much after everything I put you through. That's all right, Mackenzie, Harmony said gently. You're right that Kim and Paul will need time to get used to you. You did some hurtful things to your dad and they were there for him. Mackenzie looked like she might cry. Harmony spoke softly now. But in this family... We don't hide from the bad things. We talk them out and deal with them so we can move on. You have a lot to make up for, including with Kim. Just so you know, Melody and I haven't thought too kindly of you either for quite a while. Mackenzie fought back tears and nodded quietly. Harmony got up, moved to Mackenzie's side, and sat down next to her, pulling her into a hug. Lowering her voice, she spoke to Mackenzie in a comforting way, like she did with our kids. But what we saw tonight is something we never expected. We've witnessed the beginning of healing between you and our dear husband. This could not have happened without your honesty with him. He has been hurt deeply, but he is not a cruel person. If he can forgive you, then we as his wives can do the same. Melody leaned on my shoulder and wrapped her arm around mine while Mackenzie hugged Harmony. She began to cry again, holding on to Harmony as if she had known her forever. Harmony closed her eyes, hugging Mackenzie back warmly. It's okay, sweetie, just let it all out. She said to my daughter and kissed the top of her smooth head. It took a little longer, but then Harmony opened her eyes, looked at me and smiled. Mackenzie's eyes were very red, tears were streaming down her face, and she was holding on to Harmony tightly. Mackenzie looked upset. She glanced at me, her eyes pleading for help. Then she looked from Melody, who was holding my arm, back to Harmony and then down to her lap. I'm really sorry, everyone. Daddy, I love you so much, and even though I can't change what I've done, I want to try and make it better for you with the time I have left. Mackenzie, Harmony said kindly, it's going to be okay. We are here for you, no matter what happens next. We hope everything gets better, and you have a long time to make things right with your father. But no more bad thoughts. Agreed? Mackenzie gave Harmony a small smile as Harmony handed her a napkin from the table to wipe her face. Agreed, said my daughter. 
We stayed like that for a few minutes, and Melody just held on to me, leaning on my shoulder and kissing my shoulder now and then. Finally, after the third kiss, I pulled her up and gave her a gentle kiss on the lips. Mackenzie, who had been watching, giggled. Well, I guess it's true. My dad likes redheads. We laughed. I think that's clear, Mackenzie, Melody said. Your dad is with us. No, I mean redheads. My mom was a redhead, too. Melody tilted her head, looking confused. We've met Carol. She's not a redhead. She's a dark blonde, almost brown. I felt myself blush, knowing where this was heading. Mackenzie noticed it, too. Now Harmony was eyeing me with the same look, and both my wives exclaimed together, No way! In that special way only twins can do when they figure something out. The color of the carpet doesn't match the curtains. I laughed, shaking my head. Melody playfully hit me. You sneaky guy, all these years and you never said a word. Well, to be honest, I've been focused on two other redheads and trying to forget my ex-wife. It was true, and I got teasing looks from both my girls and a dad, that's too much info look from Mackenzie. Melody turned back to Mackenzie. How did you find out about that, Mackenzie? Mackenzie looked embarrassed. Well, I guess you're pretty open about bodies, and I'm learning not to be shy in the hospital. She took a breath and continued. When I was 14, I asked Mom about something. I usually have dark brown hair, but I had some light red down below. Mom said it was normal and that I got my color from her. We all chuckled, but then Mackenzie suddenly looked serious. Dad, her tone changed, sounding serious again. If I had known even half of what I understand now, I would have seen that Mom was already seeing someone else. I would have done more to stick by you, no matter what. I missed so many years of feeling loved and cared for, instead of thinking I was just a burden. We exchanged glances, knowing that the man Mom was with would never truly care for her like a real dad. We always believed that Carol put her daughter first. Finally, Mackenzie took a deep breath. I know Mom loves me and she cares, but sometimes, especially with my illness, I feel like I'm more about her image. At first, I was the new daughter of Dr. Someone Special. We all smiled at that remark. Then lately, it's been all about my daughter has cancer and playing the pity card but it feels like I'm just a reason for her to talk to others. In the last few hours, I've been able to talk, cry, and laugh. That hurt just as much as my cancer treatment. I've had to think about how I've treated my dad. She glanced at me, then looked down at the table again. But none of you have turned away from me. With mom, when things got tough, she would leave the room and let me handle it alone. It felt like she was embarrassed by me. She looked at us all, I know I've done you wrong, especially Dad, and I was so disrespectful. I need to say sorry to all of you because even with my mistakes, I felt more love here in less than a day than I have in seven years with Mom. We all fell quiet. We'll get through this, Pumpkin. It will take time, but we'll get there, okay? I said, and my wives nodded in agreement. Why is your last name now Brown? Harmony asked Mackenzie. It was Mom's maiden name, I answered, before Mackenzie could speak. Mackenzie just nodded. I couldn't reach out to Dad to ask if I could take my real last name back after everything that happened, so when Mom divorced that man, I dropped the name Morrison and went with her maiden name instead. A sob slipped from her lips. Even then, Mom wasn't pleased. She thought I should keep that man's last name because he legally adopted me and she believed part of his money should be mine since she wouldn't get much from the divorce. We sat together in silence for a while, each lost in our own thoughts. Then we switched gears and talked about happier things. We shared stories about our time together. We recounted how we first met, our early dates, and the surprise we saw from people when they realized the three of us were together. We told her about our trips to the U.S. and Europe, how the girls tried to teach me to ski, and how many times I fell before I found out how much I liked snowboarding. At last, we sat together and shared stories about our daily lives with the kids. Around 10 o'clock, I noticed that Mackenzie was eager to keep chatting, but she was really tired. I took her to a guest bedroom and showed her where the bathroom and towels were for the morning. Grandpa's room is down the hall, and ours is next to the kids' room if you need anything, okay, pumpkin? I told Mackenzie with a smile. Before I could say more, she hugged me tightly. I love you, Daddy, my 22-year-old daughter said. I held her close. I love you too, but now it's time to sleep. 
We can talk more in the morning, all right? I told her gently. Okay, she said. After we said goodnight, I went to my bedroom where the girls were already asleep in bed. I took a quick shower and put on a pair of light cotton shorts. I climbed into bed and my daughters snuggled in next to me. I checked on the kids a little while ago, Melody said with a smile. They're not in their beds. They're all piled up on the floor. Uncle Paul set it up for them. I kissed her and said, thank you, my love. I feel bad that all of this happened on family BBQ night. Don't worry about it, Harmony said as she leaned in for her kiss. Tonight was unexpected, but I saw something amazing that I never thought I would see. Melody and I raised our eyebrows in surprise. I saw a part of you come back to life. As much as we love you, Mackenzie's absence was a big gap we couldn't fill. Tonight, we saw a part of you restored. That night, I fell asleep with my wives in my arms, feeling peaceful and restful. The next morning, the family got all the kids ready for breakfast in town. Harmony, Mackenzie, and I went to the hospital early to do some tests for marrow and plasma to see if I could help with Mackenzie's treatment. It would take about two days to get the full results back. Carol called Mackenzie, and she told her that she was with me for the tests and would let her know where we were later. I sensed a distance between mother and daughter that I had never noticed before. It seemed that as Mackenzie and I were reconnecting, the gap between her and Carol was growing. This might have been caused by what we were discovering about some past misunderstandings. We met up with the family at a breakfast place we often enjoyed. It was nice to see three generations of family together. It was a little chaotic, with kids running around, parents and grandparents sipping coffee, and the staff doing their best to serve everyone. One small thing I noticed was that Mackenzie always sat next to me during those early days. Melody or Harmony would often give up their spot so Mackenzie could be by my side. A few times when we had one of our four kids on our laps, little Grace always seemed to want to be close to Mackenzie. I often saw her following Mackenzie around whenever she could. Out of all my kids, Grace had a special bond with her older half-sister and always wanted to be near her. At one point, Carol joined us but didn't stay long. I think it was because my girls were giving her some hard looks, and Mackenzie kept telling her that she was fine and didn't need her hovering all the time. So when Carol started talking about how tough it was for just the two of them, and how she had to give up so much for Mackenzie's care, everyone, even Mackenzie, paid her no attention. Two days later, when my test results came back, things got really tense with Carol. I was a perfect match for Mackenzie, and if we acted fast— we could fit it into Mackenzie's treatment plan without any big problems. Mackenzie's doctor was already in Sydney, so I took a week off work and planned to take Mackenzie to Sydney for the first step in two days. You've got to be kidding, Terry. Mackenzie and I can't just drop everything and go to Sydney. I need to plan things, Carol said, clearly upset as we told her what we were doing. We were sitting together on my back deck while Harmony helped Mackenzie pack some clothes and Melody watched the younger kids with Paul and Kim. Carol, this isn't up for discussion. This is going to happen no matter what you have planned. We have a chance to do the procedure the day after tomorrow in Sydney. Terry, I have to arrange hotels and other things. I can't get there, so it won't work. I could almost picture her stomping her foot under the table. I smiled a little and said, That doesn't matter. You don't have to be there. What do you mean? My ex-wife replied, confused. You're not the one going through the procedure. Mackenzie and I are. I'll take care of all the flights and hotel details. But I need to be there. She was getting upset, and I could see her frustration coming through. What right do you have to decide what I can or cannot do with my daughter? Carol scolded me. Remember, she isn't even your daughter anymore, so back off, Terry. She can't go until I say she can. Carol crossed her arms and glared at me. Mom! Would you really stop me from getting the best care just because it doesn't fit your plans? Mackenzie said as she walked over to us. And don't speak that way to someone who can help save my life, whether he's a stranger or your ex-husband. Carol paused, realizing Mackenzie had heard our conversation. Well, no, dear, of course not. Terry was just being stubborn, and I was trying to share some facts with him. Carol looked flustered but gave me a slight smirk. Mackenzie came and sat down next to me. Carol struggled to keep her feelings in check as Mackenzie reached down and took her hand. Mackenzie began, So, about those things you mentioned, it felt to me like you were bragging to Dad that you made him give me up. 
Mackenzie's expression was serious. Or did you just pressure a young girl to sign adoption papers that kept me from my father? For a little while, the girls exchanged sharp words until Mackenzie couldn't hold back anymore. You lied, Mom, she shouted, her voice full of anger. For years, I thought Dad wanted nothing to do with us. I believed he left and never looked back because you and that jerk said he was just a poor plumber and not a real man. But it was you. You are the one who lied. You cheated on Dad with that loser. Mackenzie had been thinking a lot over the past few days, and now she let it all out. Carol was confused about what was happening. When Dad and I talked the other night, and then over the last few days, we shared a lot. Mackenzie paused, letting her words hang in the air. Talking to him has shown me that you never really loved Dad. And when I remember how you treated me and how you played with my feelings, it was almost as hurtful as what we did to him. I honestly wonder if you even care about me, Mackenzie said, her voice filled with anger. Mackenzie, sweetheart, how could you say that? Carol started, but she felt like she was losing control of the situation. It's easy, she interrupted. These last few days, reconnecting with Dad, talking with Melody and Harmony and meeting my little brothers and sisters. She smiled at me. I have felt more love and acceptance here than I ever did with you or that jerk who I'm ashamed to call my legal father. Mackenzie Grace Brown, Carol exclaimed, standing up in shock. How dare you? Who has taken you to the hospital, made sure you got your medication? Who drove us here to ask my ex-husband and your former father for help? Yes, Mom, that was you. But let me ask, was there ever a time you took me to the hospital when you didn't take a selfie for social media? Did you ever just go without seeking sympathy online from others about your struggles? Did you ever pick up my meds without telling them how difficult things were with your husband or how he didn't support you? Carol opened her mouth, but no words came out. It took me almost six weeks to get you to come here to ask Dad. You didn't want to do it, saying he wouldn't care about us. Both you and that jerk seemed not to care about me unless it was easy for you. She looked at her mother again. On paper, it might say that jerk is my father, but I know who really raised me. Here's the rewritten version in simpler language. No matter how we treated him, he didn't complain at all when he set up the test and the procedure to try to save my life. That's not fair, Mackenzie, Carol said. I was the one who arranged for your care. I got us out of Stephen's house when he went to jail. I drove us here. Just because Terry can help doesn't mean he can take you away from me without talking to me first. He is talking to you, Mom, Mackenzie replied, sounding frustrated. This talk is about how Dad and I can get the procedure done before my next treatment. He wants to help me. Why don't you? Carol had no reply for a moment, then looked at me with narrowed eyes. I knew it, she declared. This is all your fault, Terry. It hasn't even been a week since we came to ask for your help, and now you've turned her against me. I'm not doing anything, Carol, I said calmly. That's nonsense, Terry. Just a week ago, my daughter needed me to do everything. Now she wants to go to Sydney with a man who hasn't even noticed her in seven years. Mom, Mackenzie shouted. This isn't about you. Can you just listen for once and understand that I need this procedure or I might die? We saw Carol's expression change as she realized the weight of Mackenzie's words. Then Mackenzie changed her approach. Mom, do you remember about six months after we left Dad? Carol shot her an angry glance. Mackenzie raised her hand to pause. Yes, Mom. We left Dad. He didn't leave us. Him coming here was because of what we did to him. She waited for that to hit, then continued. Do you remember right before the divorce was final, when I begged you to take me to see Dad? You told me he was happier without us. So instead, you and your boyfriend took me to Sydney to distract me. You both took me out, but do you know what? Carol looked at her. You didn't even ask what I wanted to do. I was crying for my father. You took me to a restaurant and a show, but it was all about you two, not about me. Carol shook her head. No, sweetie, it was about you. You were just a teenager. How were you supposed to know what you wanted? You could have asked, Mackenzie shot back. If you had, I would have loved to do a lot of things, but do you know what really hurt on that trip? She paused for effect. That night, your boyfriend decided to take you out without me. You didn't even care. You laughed at the idea. You left me, a devastated 15-year-old, alone in a hotel room for hours without asking if I wanted to come, or even if I could order room service. You didn't check on me when you got back. She shook her head at that memory. Carol looked blank as she processed it. 
I tried to stay out of it and hoped neither of them noticed me. When we got back to Maitland, that jerk scolded me in front of you for having the nerve to order some ice cream while you two were out. Do you remember what you said when he yelled at me? Carol looked down and shook her head. You said, and she pretended to be Carol in a fancy voice, Stephen, dear, she'll know better next time and ask before doing something that affects us. I gave Carol a hard look and Mackenzie joined me. Know my place. Mackenzie whispered, that's what you said. After that, you and that jerk went to court, and when things didn't go your way, you blamed Dad in front of everyone. I was hurt but went along with it because I didn't know what to think. I loved you, Mom, she groaned. And with you making me feel like Dad didn't want me, I tried to hold on to you and make you happy. I was so confused. Both of us were wrong. Look, Mackenzie. Carol shot me an anxious look, hoping for my help, but I just stared back at her. This isn't the time for this. Are you serious, Mom? Seven years not counting the time of your affair and we can't talk about this? It's just the three of us. Everyone else is giving us space. If not now, when? Carol began moving her mouth in a way that looked strange. I decided it was my turn to speak up. Listen, Carol, I think you need to realize Mackenzie has some things to sort out, maybe even more than us. We were adults then, but Mackenzie was just a teenager facing all of this. She wasn't, Carol shot back. We gave her everything, clothes, trips, the best schools. But what about love? I asked. She, she had that too. Stephen and I loved her. We gave her everything we had. I think you're mixing up what love really is. Can't you see it? Can't you understand? I sighed deeply. Carol, our daughter, never needed things. She never needed to feel like an object to be put away when not in use. She needed time and care. Being a loving parent means putting her needs before your wishes. I looked over at the house where my wives and kids were. I've learned over these seven years that real love means doing everything for others to show you care. It means accepting who they are and what they choose, just because you love being with them. I sighed again and turned my eyes back to Carol. When you came by the other day with Mackenzie, you both told me about her illness. It was so hard to hear that I almost said no to everything. Mackenzie gasped and squeezed my arm. I thought both of you were gone from my life for good. Honestly, I finally have a good job where I feel valued, and I have four amazing kids to help fix the mistakes I thought I made. I love my two amazing wives, and one of them shows me much more love than you ever did. Now it was my turn to speak up, so I made my point clear. Years ago, I was sitting out here with Kim talking about my girls compared to both of you. I looked at Mackenzie and gently squeezed her hand. Then I turned back to Carol. At that time, I was starting to love both of them, and I was confused about how I could be with two people at once. Finally, after I made a comment, Kim looked at me and said, Double or nothing, right? Back then, I agreed. But now, it means a lot more to me. Carol, I've come to realize that just like the gambling phrase those words come from, you left me with nothing. I walked away empty-handed. But when Melody and Harmony entered my life, I took a chance even though it was hard to open up, and I committed myself fully. You pointed out that I have everything now, and you're right. I have money. I have two wives who are so much better than you were, and I have four wonderful children that I love dearly. Carol looked surprised but I kept talking. I have a great house, and despite everything that's happened, I might have a chance to mend my bond with Mackenzie. I can help her. But if that means I have to leave you out of it to protect her emotions, you need to understand something. Carol stared at me. I'm totally okay with hurting your feelings. Mackenzie laughed next to me before Carol could respond. Listen, Mom, I know this might upset you, but it's happening. Dad is taking me to Sydney tonight, and we're going to start the procedure tomorrow evening. I believe Dad was right when he said it's better for you to head back home. He can take care of me for a while. Carol kept protesting. I guess she couldn't see beyond her own feelings. Soon, our talk turned into an argument. The more Carol resisted, the bigger the gap between her and her daughter grew. From what Mackenzie told me and other stories I've heard since that first weekend of healing, I've come to see that what Carol and her partner did was nearly abusive. And let me be clear, I understand some of that. Families argue and disagree. I had two fiery, red-headed wives with strong personalities that could bring anyone to their knees. But the truth is that families don't always get along. Still, even when you disagree, you need to act responsibly. 
You don't leave your child alone for hours in a big city without anyone to watch them. But Carol didn't see that, and that's what caused everything to go wrong when it wasn't about her. Later that evening, Melody, Mackenzie, and I set off for the airport in Sydney. Harmony wanted to join us, but someone had to stay with the kids. It seemed she lost at rock, paper, scissors to her sister, two to three. The operation was simple for me. They put me under anesthesia, took some marrow from my body, and put it into Mackenzie's. They hoped her body would accept it. I would also give blood regularly after each of her chemotherapy sessions. The plan was that my blood would help her get better faster than if she healed on her own. I didn't understand all the science, but it had worked for three other patients in the U.S. with the same type of cancer. So we decided to go ahead. After the operation, Mackenzie chose to come back with us to Bathurst, which surprised her mother. Carol had thought Mackenzie would return to Maitland after the first operation. The next few months were a bit strange. Mackenzie moved into our house, and it took some time to get used to her being there. She had her friends send over most of her things because she didn't trust Carol to send them. During the day, she spent a lot of time with the kids and would join me and my daughters in the evenings. We talked often about her time with her mother and Morrison. Melody, Harmony, and I were shocked by some of her stories. Mackenzie and I shared many tears and worked on rebuilding our connection. Overall, I was glad to have her back in my life, but everything changed again on my birthday. I woke up early to a surprising feeling. Melody was leaning over me, and I was still trying to understand what was happening. She smiled at me as she celebrated my birthday. At the same time, Harmony was beside me, adding to the special moment. The birthday surprises kept coming, and it felt overwhelming but exciting. After a shower and getting dressed, we all gathered with the kids who were having breakfast. William, Martha, and even Mackenzie gave me cheeky looks. Happy birthday, Daddy! All four of my little ones cheered together. For the next 20 minutes, I had the attention of four excited kids as I opened their gifts, wrapped in colorful paper covered in crayon drawings. Melody gave me a brand new Remington, 308 rifle. I had started target shooting about a year ago. Harmony gifted me a beautiful 16X50 scope that probably cost nearly as much as the rifle. William and Martha gave me a spotting scope for the shooting range. And I couldn't believe it, but Mackenzie had bought me a top-quality bipod stand. Now, I had everything I needed for long-range shooting. I sat on the couch getting ready to unwrap more gifts when Mackenzie came over. She looked a bit nervous as she perched on the coffee table beside my presence. What's wrong, pumpkin? I asked her. Without saying a word, she pulled out another present. This one looked quite old. The wrapping paper was worn and had some tears. I blinked in surprise. Tears filled her eyes as she handed it to me. Her voice was shaky when she said, This is for you, Dad. I opened the card. She told me, I wrote this the week before your birthday more than seven years ago. The card was simple, with a golf ball on the front. Inside, I found a note. Dad, I don't know what I did to make you not want to see us these last few months. I really miss you, but Mom says we can't talk to you because soon Stephen will be my new dad. I'm not sure I want a new dad. I miss my old one. I hope you have a happy birthday. I love you, Dad. Your daughter, Mackenzie. Goxoxo. I set the card down carefully and looked up at Mackenzie, then back at the present. The room fell silent. Even Mackenzie's four little half-siblings were watching quietly. I slowly unwrapped the gift and found three items inside. The first was a plain black cotton shirt. At that time, I had wanted something light and comfy to wear after a shower, so I guessed Mackenzie had heard me talking to her mother. The second was a pair of cotton boxers with little hearts on them. The last item was a small pocket knife, a leather man, which had many tools. On the side, it read, My Dad, Terry Other, Love Mackenzie. I looked at Mackenzie again, then back at the gifts, then back at her again. Thank you, I managed to say, and then I pulled her into a tight hug. We were both crying. I whispered, I love you, pumpkin. Melody picked up the card, read the writing on the knife, and joined the hug. Harmony came over too. For all those years, Mackenzie had kept that gift, not knowing if she could ever give it to me. Finally, little Beth came over and wrapped her little arms around us. First, she looked up at me, then over to Mackenzie, and then to Melody. Mummy, doesn't Dad like Sister Mac's present? She asked. No, sweetie, Melody said. 
I think he likes Sister Mackenzie's gift the most. Better than mine? John asked. We all laughed. I love all your gifts equally, but Daddy has really wanted that gift for a long time, and your big sister was finally able to give it to me, I told them. Once we got the kids ready, Martha offered to take them to daycare today. This gave Melody, Harmony, and me a break from our parenting duties. So, with Mackenzie, we decided to head into town for a birthday brunch and maybe some shopping. While we were getting ready, the next surprise of the day came. Terry, there's a man at the front door with a package you need to sign for, Melody said, curiosity in her eyes. I laughed. It's probably another birthday present. I hope this one is cash. I signed for an envelope and the man said thanks but stayed there. Is there something else? Yes, sir. I need you to read the paper inside and let me know which time you prefer for a meeting, the courier said. I opened the envelope, wondering what this was about, and started reading the letter inside. You have to be kidding me, I said, and not happily. What is it, baby? Harmony asked, holding some shoes as she walked down the hall from our bedroom. The guy is asking for a video meeting today. He says he has something important to discuss. I read the details again. He gave me three times to meet. 10.30, 12.30, or 3.30 today, using something called Microsoft Teams. I looked at the courier. You're not just a delivery guy, are you? No, sir, he replied. I actually work for the Department of Corrections. If you choose one of those times, I will tell you how to connect and chat with the person in question. He looked a bit embarrassed. I'm sorry it seems like you were getting ready to leave. We were. It's his birthday, Melody said taking the letter from my hands to read it. I looked at the man standing there, waiting for our answer. Of course he would find a way to spoil our day, I sighed. I had a great morning and was looking forward to brunch with my wives and my daughter, and now he wants to talk about something urgent. I'm sorry, sir. I understand the timing is not great, but I need a response, the man said, a little embarrassed by my honesty. I looked at Melody and she nodded. Let's go with the first time, 10.30. Let's just get it done so we can still have lunch. What do I need to do? The man started flipping through a folder. Do you have a computer with internet and a webcam? He asked. He does. I shrugged. Over time, I noticed she wasn't happy being married to someone like a plumber, someone who dealt with messes for a little bit of money, he said, trying to provoke me. But I didn't take the bait. I could give her a better life. I was a surgeon at Maitland Central Hospital. I had money and a nice house where we spent time together. Did I mention that she was really attractive? He raised his eyebrows at me. The first time Carol and I got close, I knew she was mine. You never had a chance with her, did you? He smiled smugly. I shrugged again. No, but I never really wanted to be with her like that. I thought it was better to stay away. He lost his cool for a moment. I could hear some muffled laughter from the other room where the girls were watching. After a second, he brushed it off. Once I was close to her, she was all mine. It wasn't hard for me to convince her to leave you. The best part was getting her to let me adopt Mackenzie. That took away your chance to be a father. He grinned. Even now, while I'm here in jail, Mackenzie is still mine. I've spoiled her with trips, jewelry, clothes, and things you could never provide. Right now, your daughter is living a great life, and your ex-wife misses me, waiting for me to get out so we can be a family. I raised my eyebrows, staying calm. He didn't know that I was updated on everything or that I was helping Mackenzie with her cancer treatment and that she was in the next room listening to this call. Still, he thought I was interested, and that excited him. Oh yes, Carol loves being with me, both for my looks and my mind. Mackenzie also listens to me, asking for advice on investments and school choices. Your gift to her for university was a nice surprise. Both of them were happy to have the money and to be far away from you. Mackenzie even celebrated that night with her friends, then came to talk to me a month later when I ended up here. He gestured around him, acting like he chose to be there, not because he had pleaded guilty. I sighed, tired of his bragging. I could hear some quiet fuming from the other room, where I knew Mackenzie was likely upset. I had learned how much she disliked the man on my screen. So what is it that you want? I asked. I want to give you access, he said simply. Access? I replied, confused. He sighed dramatically and spread his arms like a preacher trying to offer salvation. I remembered that gesture from our earlier meeting at Maitland Central. It didn't work back then, and it wasn't working now. 
Yes, access, Terry. I paused. He got my attention just by saying my name, not as an insult. He knew he had me interested. He went on, since you are not part of your old family's life anymore, you might not know about some things that have happened. He waited for that to sink in. I'm offering you a chance to see your ex-wife and your daughter in exchange for some help if you follow me. I scoffed. And why would I want to talk to my ex-wife or my daughter at all? They threw me away for fancy trips and some idea of being better than me. So forgive me for not seeing anything special in you. But my question is still the same. Why would I want to see them? He leaned in close like he was about to tell me a secret. Because no matter how you feel about Carol, me, and especially Mackenzie, she is your blood. And when I tell you this, you will want to see her more than anything else. But I have a price for that. At this point, it was clear where he was headed. He wanted something from me to reveal that Mackenzie was sick. So I decided to play along for a little longer. I still don't see why I'd want to talk to them, let alone help someone I have good reason to be angry with if we were in the same room. How's your jaw holding up? I smirked back at him. He smiled and shook his head. Terry, my clueless and unfortunate plumbing friend, my jaw is nothing and once I share my secret, you'll wish you had listened earlier. Enough with the drama. You're a loser and a criminal and from what I've heard, pretty sad in your personal life, so let's get to the point. I spat at him. He laughed, thinking he had won. We're almost there, foolish plumber. First, tell me my price. All right, let's hear it then. He chuckled. First, I want you to agree to pay me $100,000. It doesn't need to be all at once. I've got a few years to collect. Just pay me something for my trouble. Deal? I wanted to laugh, but I held back. Sounds like you have more than one request? I do indeed. I also want you to have your sister speak to the DA and try to get a shorter sentence for me. Hmm, so you want money and help with your sentence in exchange for some big news about my daughter that you think will make me care about you. Let's not get into how both of those might be illegal, but it must be quite a secret. It is, he replied. His smile was big, thinking he had the upper hand. Well, first I could just call Carol or Mackenzie myself. Did you think of that? His smile stayed in place even as he seemed to freeze for a moment. Then he tried to mislead me again. You can't. They have new numbers and they live far away now. You're just a plumber with no way to reach them. If only he knew. He must have forgotten or didn't bother to check my new job. So you're saying I can't reach them unless I go through you? Yep. Then why would I want to do that? He paused, letting his smile drop for effect. Because Mackenzie is really sick, she can barely move. Really? He put on a serious face. Yes, and even though we haven't always seen eye to eye, if you help me, I can connect you with Carol and Mackenzie so you can say goodbye to her. Today is your birthday, and I set up this meeting to give you this gift. You help me, and I'll help you see Mackenzie, because I know you still care about her. I'm not completely heartless. He tried to sound wise. I started to laugh. It built up from my toes, causing me to curl them. My chest filled with big breaths as I laughed. Tears streamed down my face, and I slapped the table a few times. He just kept smiling, but as I calmed down, he got serious again. Terry, this isn't funny. Mackenzie is sick, and you really need me to get in touch with her if you want to say goodbye. If you don't, it will haunt you forever. Plus, I wouldn't want to stop my daughter from seeing her father one last time. I held back my laughter, waving him off while signaling the girls. Oh, sorry, I think you're mistaken if you think my laughter means I care. Trust me, it's the opposite. This has been one of the funniest conversations I've had in a long time. You're right, today is my birthday, and your offer has been quite entertaining. But I need to be clear about something before I give you a real answer to your favor, okay? All right. If you promise to be serious, I can handle it, he replied. Just then, all three girls walked into the room, dressed and ready to take me out. Melody wore a light blue summer dress and her hair was pulled back nicely. Harmony wore a yellow dress and her hair was done up like her sister's. Mackenzie was in jeans and a summer top. I've known for a long time that she dreams of me while she's with you in bed. As I told her, you may have unknowingly put me in a tough spot for 18 months while you charmed and deceived my wife. But with your small stature and lack of understanding about loving a woman, she could never forget the joy I brought her. Because of her dreams alone, 
you also ended up in this difficult place. I leaned back and he looked upset. But, but, you're just a plumber. You're not even married to them. Get lost, you liar, he spat, clearly struggling to believe what I was saying. Harmony laughed, interjecting playfully. Sorry, but Terry here is our guy, and trust me, it's not just about his charm. He has skills that really impress us, she said, teasingly indicating her excitement. I felt a bit proud and glanced to the side. So, Stephen, as you can see, I have no interest in reconnecting with Carol, which brings us to the second part of your request. I really enjoy being a plumber. Sure, I've had to deal with some tough jobs like cleaning nasty tanks or unclogging toilets, but it's honest work, and I don't regret any of it. However, I said, smiling as I continued, for several years now, I haven't just been a plumber. Since I left Maitland, I've run quality for Delotis Inc. Actually, my wonderful wives here are the owner's daughters and the future leaders of the company. You might remember William and Martha Delotis, the nice couple who were with me when we first met. I raised my eyebrows, watching realization spread across his face. Yes, that's right. They are my wives' parents. So you think I'm broke? Far from it. I'm part of a family with more resources than you can imagine. I paused to let that sink in. He took the bait. So what? You think you're a superstar who can charm sisters? But without me, you won't find Mackenzie and talk to her before it's too late. Now that I know you've got money, you need to pay me half a million if you want to speak to your precious Mackenzie. I pretended to be hurt. Stephen, I said slowly, emphasizing his name. The way you're trying to pressure me for money just to see my daughter makes it sound like you never really cared for her. He let out a bitter laugh and shrugged. Not really, no, he said honestly. She came with Carol. Carol thought if I adopted her and put a restraining order on you, Mackenzie would stay out of your way. You'd be furious. I never cared about that sad teenager who cried almost every night because of her dad. Mackenzie was still not in sight, and it seemed like her love for her mother was fading away. The jerk kept talking. I'll admit that while she was a pain for me and Carol most of the time, she was helpful sometimes. Like that day outside the cafe when she confronted you, and when she took you to court after you left that message on her birthday, I almost liked her. Her mother was eager for her to grow up and leave the house so Carol and I could travel the world together. He shrugged. Mackenzie was just a tool for both her mother and me. He turned back to the camera. But she's not my kid, and I don't care if she lives or dies, but I know you do. So you'll pay me what I want, or by the time you find out where she is, it will be too late. So that's how it is? I replied, looking at Mackenzie. That's right, the jerk said with a smirk, crossing his arms. Look, as much as I've enjoyed our little back and forth, I said, raising my arms. Both Melody and Harmony quickly moved back with the signal, and Mackenzie slid onto my lap. I don't think you'll get anything from me, but thanks for the entertaining story for my birthday. We'll be sharing this story for years about how you tried to blackmail me. He had nothing to say, so I continued. Now, here are the real facts instead of your lies. I know that you and Carol are divorced. I know the love you think you get is from some guy in the showers, and that won't change anytime soon. I also learned the truth about what you both did to my daughter. I kissed her cheek. I now have five wonderful children. Also, Mackenzie's cancer treatment is going really well. She's not yet in remission, but we hope to fix everything soon with a bone marrow transplant, blood transfusions, and new chemo drugs. I looked at Mackenzie. Hey, Pumpkin, I know this guy is your dad, so do you want to say anything? Mackenzie looked at me, kissed my cheeks, and giggled. Thanks, Daddy, she told me. Then she turned to the screen. Listen up, jerk. You and your partner used me as a confused teenager in your game to tear apart my family. I get it. You're rude and have less manners than a wild drunk. And yes, I'm aware you aren't very impressive. But I heard everything you just said. I've spent the last few months asking my real father for forgiveness for what I did to him. So don't call, don't write, and don't try to reach out to me again. I hope my dad, Terry Other, can forgive me one day. But I hope I never see you again because if I do, you will regret it, you terrible person. Go back to your cell and be miserable. With that, she stood up and walked away. She was breathing hard and trembling a bit. Harmony, Melody, and I watched her leave. Then, without saying anything else, we turned back to the screen, and the three of us gave him the finger with big smiles on our faces before ending the call. 
Happy birthday to me. A few days later, it was Mackenzie's birthday, which was on a weekend. We planned a family BBQ for the afternoon. Dad, Paul, Kim, and the kids all came. I also invited Carol, but warned her to behave. After everything we had learned, I had to talk Mackenzie down from calling Carol to tell her not to come. I promised Mackenzie that if her mom caused any trouble, we would ask her to leave. I wasn't too upset that Mackenzie's relationship with her mom was falling apart. Over the past months, we discovered that Carol was far more tricky and manipulative than we thought. A surprise guest neither Mackenzie nor I expected was Mackenzie's old boyfriend, Ben. Ben met Mackenzie about a year ago at university, and they had been together almost from the start. When Mackenzie got sick and had to leave her studies, she broke up with Ben. She told him he deserved better than a girlfriend who was sick and might not live much longer. I hadn't heard much about him because Mackenzie cared about him a lot and was sad to let him go for what she thought was his benefit. So she was shocked when he arrived. He had been trying to reach Carol for months, but she had finally lost her patience and told him that Mackenzie lived with her birth father, who owned Deloitte's Inc. down in Bathurst. Not exactly true, but it sounded nice coming from my ex-wife. He had done some digging and managed to find his way to Melody. My wives were beginning to realize that Melody was almost as much a victim of her mother as I was. When Melody heard the story from Ben, she quickly invited him to spend the weekend with us. When Ben walked through the door and Mackenzie saw him, she dropped her glass on the lawn and they rushed to each other, hugging and crying. For the rest of the day, she hardly let go of his hand, except to give someone else a hug or show Ben something. Mackenzie looked so happy, but Carol did not seem pleased. Two important things happened that day. The first was when Mackenzie started to open her presents. My wives had taken her shopping that morning and got her a whole new wardrobe while we were getting the BBQ ready. Many old, worn-out designer clothes were gone, replaced by a fresh style that looked good without needing to be a brand name. William and Martha bought her a new iPad with a keyboard and promised to help her get back to studying. Dad also got her a new laptop for the same reason. Kim greeted her with a big hug and a kiss, happy to have her back in the family. She gave her three special bottles of rum, Bundy, Beanley, and Kraken. Later, I pulled Kim aside and asked if she was crying. She said her allergies were acting up because of the pollen, but she was really happy that Mackenzie was home. I had three gifts for Mackenzie. As we sat to open them, everyone gathered around. The first was a nice journal and a fancy pen. I told her it was for her journey through cancer. I wanted her to write her thoughts and feelings, the good and the bad, so she could look back and celebrate when she beat the illness in the future. Everyone oohed at the gift. The second gift was wrapped in paper that was a little torn and faded. Mackenzie opened it and we both started to cry because we knew how meaningful it was. The card showed cartoon teenagers at a party and said, Party on! Happy birthday! Inside, I had written a note. My dearest Mackenzie, I miss you so much, and I don't know if you'll ever see this. But please, please come back to me. I love you so much, Pumpkin. Love, Dad. You're real, Dad. I wasn't in a good place when I wrote that card, but it said what I felt. Mackenzie dropped the card and hugged me tightly. She told me she loved me and whispered how sorry she was. A few moments later, she opened the worn gift. Inside was a new set of sleepwear, an oversized T-shirt, and a very expensive scientific calculator. She had wanted it for months for school, but at over $300, it took a long time to save up for. She loved it. Even though many people used smartphones for math now, the calculator had a place of honor on her desk from then on. The last gift I gave her was a plain manila envelope. Inside was a paper saying that Mackenzie's adoption by Stephen Morrison was canceled. If she signed the paper and had it witnessed, she would once again be Mackenzie Other, daughter of Terry Other and Carol Brown. I held my daughter, who was crying happy tears this time, for almost ten minutes. When she felt ready to sign and needed witnesses, almost everyone stepped up to help. The only person who didn't was Carol. After eight long years, I finally had my daughter back. As the party was winding down, I had a chat with Carol. People were starting to go inside. Mackenzie was showing Ben the house, probably her room, too. The dad and me wanted to step in, but Mackenzie was no longer a teenager. She was in her twenties now, and I couldn't stop her from spending time with her boyfriend. My other daughters took the kids inside with Kim for baths and started a movie for them. Paul and Dad were cleaning the grill while I picked up the trash before heading inside. I had just tossed the last bag into the bin when I saw Carol standing there. 
I hope you are happy, Terry, she said, placing her hands on her hips and staring at me. It had been quite a while since I last saw her, and honestly, she still didn't look that great. She reminded me of a potato with arms and legs, maybe like a Mr. Potato Head. Well, I am, Carol. There are many things making me happy these days. Today, for instance, has been wonderful. The weather is nice, and we're celebrating our daughter's birthday. Is there something specific you want me to be happy about? I asked. She threw her hands up in frustration and turned to walk away. I hurried after her and caught up on the back deck. Carol, you can't just say something like that and walk off. Of course I can, Terry, she snapped. You've never understood me after all these years. I frowned. Understand what, Carol? I have no clue what you mean. Just say it. Yes, I'm happy, I said, feeling annoyed. I didn't want her here, but I was doing this for Mackenzie. She glared at me, clearly upset, then slumped into a chair on the patio. Terry, ever since high school, you have been my support, my safe place. For 15 years, I took you for granted. You never questioned my small decisions and did whatever you could for me. She looked up at me as I sat across from her. When we were 18, we had Mackenzie right after high school. After that, all I had was Mackenzie and you. I grew so unhappy. I thought there was something better waiting for me, everywhere except where I was. I nodded, still not sure where this was going. I always pushed you, taking whatever I wanted because I thought I deserved better. I mean, I was married to a plumber. She laughed bitterly. My friends were married to important jobs, like consultants and lawyers. Then she stared down at her arm, thinking. No one said anything, but I know they all judged me, she said, imitating a condescending voice. There goes Carol, married to that plumber guy. She looked at me and said, I waited for 15 years, taking what I could from you without going too far. I nodded. I understood that part. When Stephen came along, he impressed me with his money and success. He was so sure of himself, and when he noticed I was unhappy, it didn't take much to win me over. But he was really bad when it came to being close. Still, his money and status made up for it. My friends now saw me as someone important, not just as the plumber's partner. She paused for a moment, thinking. Then suddenly her eyes lit up with anger. But you had to ruin everything. You couldn't just give me what I wanted. If you hadn't gone to the hospital that night and given me Mackenzie's money like I asked, I would still have Stephen's wealth and everything that came with it. I leaned back, shocked. I had hoped for an apology, but that wasn't happening. Carol stood up and started walking back and forth. Stephen and I were happy, Terry. We were happy. You would have been forgotten in a few years, and Mackenzie would have come around and learned to love Stephen. We could have been a happy family. You just had to interfere. Carol. No, Terry. You sit there and listen to me for once. You ruined my life. You never did what I wanted. You did what you thought was right, not what I needed. And now you're here with those two other women? She shouted. I stood anger flashing in my eyes. Carol, you have no right to say that. Shut up, Terry, she yelled at me. I'm talking now. I stood there stunned. In all the time I'd known her, I had never seen Carol so furious. Then her voice turned from anger to desperate plea. Every time you get what you want, I always lose. You keep taking from me. It's all your fault. She pointed at me, eyes burning with fury. You took my daughter. You took all the money. You took my standing in the community. It's always about you. Why can't you just go away and leave me alone? She continued her rant. I have a job that goes nowhere and I can't move up. I'll always be known as the wife of that surgeon who snapped and tried to hurt you because of my dreams. It's your fault. You have this huge house and more money than I can count. People respect you while I'm ignored. You ended up with those two attractive women and a bunch of kids while I was left with nothing. Are you done, Carol? I asked crossing my arms and frowning at her. Not even close. You've messed up my life. You always put me down, so now it's my turn. I couldn't believe this. My family had invited Carol, and here she was yelling at me in my own home about the happiness I had found with Harmony and Melody, even after she had pushed me away. I stared at my ex-wife, ready to say something harsh, when we were interrupted. Hey, you! Melody shouted. Neither of us had noticed Melody and Harmony come up behind me, standing protectively. A few steps back, Mackenzie stood in the doorway, her eyes wide with anger. Once we saw them, my girls stepped forward. First, Harmony slapped Carol hard across the face, and then Melody hit her on the other side before she could react. You're awful, Melody snapped. 
After everything you've done to our man and his daughter, Terry convinced Mackenzie to let you come here for Mackenzie's birthday. No one likes you and we want you to leave, but we're being nice because your daughter is living with us while our husband helps her. It's her special day. Harmony jumped in next. But here you are, acting like you're better than everyone, screaming at our husband and calling us names. Carol sat on the ground, shocked, looking between them. I crossed my arms and watched my girls, a smirk on my face. Well, about that last part, you have a point, Melody said with a grin. We may have our flaws, but we're Terry's. Did you know he can make me feel things I didn't know were possible? Carol looked taken aback. Harmony pressed on. Now, you've really upset us by yelling at him. Your self-righteous act doesn't fool anyone. Your so-called friends never cared that our husband is just a plumber. They made you uncomfortable because you want money. You walk around like you're something special when you're not. Melody nodded, adding to the attack. That's why you have nothing. You can't see that you're the problem, not Terry. You blame him for everything, but you can't name a single time he started any trouble. Every fight, every injury he faced was because of your choices. Mackenzie had stepped out and stood beside me. They're right, Mom. Since the day we pushed Dad away, he never sought us out. We were the ones reaching out to him. I regret what I did back then, and I'm so glad he has accepted me back into his life today, of all days. She smiled at me, and I smiled back. Dad saved my life, Mom. He gave part of himself to help me fight my cancer. When we turned him away, he saved two wonderful women from a sinking car and even hurt himself doing it, all because he's a good person. My dad is the most loving and caring man in the world, and that's why he needs two wives. She smiled again, so all his love doesn't go to waste. But Mackenzie, Carol cried, he took everything from me. I'm sorry, but he took it from us, she begged. Come on, Mom, just grow up, Mackenzie said sharply. Every problem we've faced is because of you. Dad didn't want revenge. It was you who couldn't let things go. Dad told us to be patient, but we didn't listen. He didn't have to act against us. We did that to ourselves. I'm just glad I figured things out before I ended up like you. And while we're arguing, let's talk about how you treated me. You always took his side, betraying me in front of him and pushing me to do whatever he wanted. I was your daughter. Did you ever stand up for me? Carol looked at the four of us. My daughters were glaring at her, ready to argue again. Mackenzie appeared very disappointed and I felt upset but didn't want to get in the middle of their fight. Mackenzie sighed. Look, Mom, it was nice of the family to invite you here for my birthday, but I think you've really overstayed your welcome. Are you kicking me out? Carol asked, shocked. Mackenzie hesitated. I found my voice. No, Carol, she isn't. All four girls looked at me. I gestured for them to calm down and turned my attention to Carol. I am, I said firmly. You have overstayed your welcome today, and I want you to know you are not welcome here again. If our daughter wants to see you, she can meet you somewhere else. But Carol. She looked at me, waiting. To answer your question, I smiled. I am really happy. Let's go. I helped her up and held her arm as I led her inside to grab her coat and handbag, then walked her to her car. I didn't let go of her arm until the door opened. I leaned over and gave her a gentle kiss on the cheek. Carol, it's time for you to stop trying to come back and move on with your life without us. Goodbye. But Terry, you can't. Oh, but I can, Carol. This is my family home, and right now you're not welcome here. If you have a problem, talk to my lawyer. You know her. She's one of the people back at the house watching you from the window. She's also my older sister, and like my wives and kids, she loves me very much. If I asked her, she wouldn't hesitate to protect me. So, it's best for you to leave. I turned and walked back to the front steps where my family joined me watching Carol. My wives stood beside me, my strength and solace. In front of me were my four children. Holding hands with Harmony was my daughter, who was starting to feel sad about letting go of her relationship with her mother. But she knew she had our support and love now that she was back with me. Holding Mackenzie's other hand was Ben. He didn't say much, but I could see how much he cared for her, no matter how she was feeling. On the side were Paul and Kim, with all three of their kids. Behind them were William, Martha, and my dad, John. I had been through a lot in the last eight years and almost lost everything. If it weren't for everyone here with me today, I might not have made it. After watching Carol in her car for a moment, everyone started to go inside. Dad, young Adam asked, is that mean lady leaving now? I ruffled his hair. 
Yes, Adam, she's gone, and I don't think she's coming back. Good, he said, and ran inside to join his brother and sisters. I then heard my dad shout, Ice cream! for dessert. Dad? Mackenzie said as we stood at the front door. Yes, pumpkin? I replied. Ben is going to stay the night, okay? Sure, we can use one of the spare rooms, but we're running a little low with everyone here. She shook her head. No, Dad. He will stay in my room, okay? It was not a question, but a statement. I guess this is how William and Martha felt when their daughters turned to me. I was at a loss for words. My daughter wanted her boyfriend to stay in her room for the night, on her birthday. Melody and Harmony giggled, and Melody replied, That sounds great, sweetie. Happy birthday. I said the same. She might be 23 and an adult, but she would always be my daughter. My wives hugged me and kissed me, pulling my attention away from everything else. It's okay, baby, Melody whispered, kissing my neck. This is just what she needs. She's a smart girl, and I'm sure you won't be a grandfather too soon. Harmony chuckled at her sister's words as I held my girls close. I still watched Carol sitting in her car. I felt so much love from these two amazing women who not only restored me but gave me more than I ever had before. But then I looked at Carol again and saw her trying to leave. For a moment, our eyes met and I felt sorry for her. She would never know the kind of love we shared, the way you can feel warmth and support no matter what happens. Carol didn't understand that if you have the ones you love, you can get through almost anything. Finally, my ex-wife started her car and we watched her drive away, hopefully leaving our lives for good. If only she had understood that love is about what you give, not what you take, we would all be in very different places today. Sadly, I don't think Carol would ever figure that out. She would always blame others for her troubles. As she drove out of sight, I heard laughter coming from inside the house. I could hear everyone enjoying themselves, but my heart smiled when I heard Mackenzie's laugh. Melody and Harmony pulled me inside, and we all circled around a big birthday cake, singing happy birthday to my daughter. Life was good. Five years later, the letter had arrived in the mail about a week ago, but she didn't open it. She was too scared. Bills were easier to manage. She either paid them or ignored them until she had the money. That evening, when she got home to her small apartment, just a short walk from her job, she tossed her bag on the couch and went to her tiny kitchen. She warmed up some leftovers and poured herself a small glass of cheap red wine while stretching. The limp she had from the accident four years ago was still there, and some days she couldn't walk without a cane. Being very overweight from eating too much and feeling sad didn't help either. She sat back on the couch, turned on the news, and ate her plain dinner while sipping her wine. They didn't match, but it was all she could afford. When she set her bowl down on the side table, her hand brushed against the letter and she jumped back like it was about to bite her. For a long time, she just stared at the letter, then sighed. Finally, she pushed her messy hair back, picked up the letter with her swollen fingers, and opened it. Though not very neat, it was in handwritten form. His words were always easy to understand. She smiled at the spelling and grammar mistakes. He was a plumber, not a writer. With a sip of wine, she began to read. Carol, I hope this letter finds you feeling better than when we last met. I hope your injuries have healed and you have found some peace after everything that happened. I wasn't happy with how you reacted, but I can't blame you for what your ex-husband did. Who knew he would be on a work release at the hospital that day, but he's now gone, and you faced the fallout from your actions. All I wanted was for both of us to be there for Mackenzie's last treatment. I thought it would be a nice gesture to invite you. I might not have liked you for a long time, but you were there at the start of our daughter's cancer journey, so I wanted you to be there for the end. Unfortunately, things just got out of hand. It took Harmony nearly a year to walk again after you and your ex-husband hurt her. She's almost fully healed now, but her leg still aches when the weather gets cold. You are lucky that your ex-husband died that day, or I believe his words would have put you in jail too. Speaking of which, what were you thinking? Everyone knows I would never have been involved with you, as you told Harmony, and she knew that. And just so you know, Melody's hand has healed from the gunshot wound she got when your ex-husband tried to hurt us all. Dear Carol, I want you to know that none of us can forgive you for what you did. My love for my wives has only grown. Every day I feel closer to them. Their love saved both me and Mackenzie on a difficult day. I think about you and how much I dislike you, but... 
Their love helps me stay strong. You couldn't just leave things alone. You had to encourage the troublemaker and make fun of me when it suited you. If you hadn't done that, he might still be here. And these past four years wouldn't have been so hard for everyone. Believe it or not, Mackenzie asked me to write this to you. She said to be honest, so I'm going to tell you the truth. Speaking of Mackenzie, our daughter makes me so proud. She beat cancer and earned her degree. She married Ben, and they just had their first child. Can you believe we're grandparents now? That's the main reason I'm writing. Mackenzie and I talk about you a lot, but she hasn't reached out because she feels hurt and embarrassed by you. After he passed away, she found it hard to be your daughter. I tried to tell you many times that you needed to care for others, to have kindness and respect, and to understand real love. But you never did. And because of that, you lost your daughter, her husband, and our new grandbaby. I'm including some photos of Mackenzie, Ben, and little Jordan. He's lively with big brown eyes and strong hands. Mackenzie jokes that he will be a plumber like his grandfather. I'm not sure about that, but I'll support him in whatever he chooses. Don't expect to be invited to any birthdays or baby showers. There is not much love for you in our family. I partly feel this way because I don't have good things to say about you. I wish I could feel differently, but I'll always be angry for the pain you've caused. And just to be clear, this is all on you. You caused this from the day you cheated. You need to pick yourself up now because no one who once loved you cares what happens to you anymore. I don't know if I'll write to you again. Maybe in a few years if things change. But none of us wants any contact with you, so please don't write back. Take care, Terry Other. Your ex-husband, P. S. I write this to show how much love there is in my life. Husband to Melody Other. Husband to Harmony Other. And father to Mackenzie McDonald, Adam, Grace, Beth, and John. Grandfather to Jordan McDonald Carroll read the letter three times. Then she carefully folded it and placed it back in the envelope. In her small bedroom, she had a special box filled with keepsakes. She added the letter to the box with old photos. There were pictures of her and Terry on vacation, laughing and enjoying their time in Bali. There were also photos of her when she was pregnant with Mackenzie, looking bright and happy. Some pictures showed Terry in his work clothes at the job site, working hard to support their family. As she looked at the images, a sad smile crossed her face. She had lost so much nearly everything, because she didn't realize that what she and Terry had was love. She gazed at the picture of a young Terry, strong and smiling, proud to be with her for just a moment. I'm sorry, she whispered to the photo. But as tears streamed down her face, she was all alone, and no one noticed or cared. 